teams. Conversation with Sherry Brumbaugh of Gardner Trucking. Those stories and more coming up on this Freight Waves Now. I'm Thomas Watson. Joining me today is Bill Priestley. Coming up, we're going to talk with Mary O'Connell about the future of ARC Best, as well as enforcement of non-competes. And we'll have our research corner coming up in the next hour. But first, our top story heads west once again, as a California district court has ruled that Proposition 22 is legal in that state, which means drivers for companies like Uber and Lyft can work as independent contractors, at least for now. John Kingston joins us more to untangle this mess. John, welcome, sir. Hello, Thomas. How are you? Hello, Bill. How are you? Things Good. do How change are you? in the business, don't they? Yeah. This is not, never, this is never, not never what we were going to talk about, but we'll have to talk about it now. So, yeah. So uh, Prop 22 gets upheld uh, in a California appellate court. I guess, first off, what's the immediate fallout from this, uh, especially for California drivers, as well as California uh, trucking uh, carriers as well that are based in that state? All right, first of all, there was no impact on trucking. Prop 22 okay. was a referendum passed in, uh, on Election Day 2020 that was specifically aimed at app-based drivers like Uber, Lyft, DoorDash. Uh, and so there is no impact on trucking at all. It is true, of course, that, Pro that uh, Prop 22 was designed to block AB5, the independent contract law in California, from being implemented against app-based drivers. Uh, let's remember that really the two primary targets of AB5 were trucking, and that was blocked for months. It's not anymore. And, uh, and app-based drivers, and now that continues to be blocked. So uh, the history here is that Prop 22 won uh, in November 2020, keeping AB5 out of the app-based driver business. That was overturned on a uh, by, by a judge uh, to rule it to be, be unconstitutional within six months after after election day. And then what happened yesterday was that a three judge panel in a rather complex decision uh, overturned the lower court decision, but with enough ambiguity that an appeal ought to be very interesting. And, you know, for folks who may be like the drivers like Uber, Lyft, working for DoorDash, uh, what does this passage of this mean for their day to day? Should I be worried yet or should I wait for an appeal? Well, I mean, there's, there, there's nothing day to day. They're continuing to do business because AB5 is, is now, because of Prop 22, blocked from their business. Um, I wouldn't say that they'd be nervous, but I think they certainly need to keep their eye on an appeal, which, you know, we're going to take some time. Uh, it's, it, as I said, it's a complex case. The, 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 the legal questions that were involved here in the lower court decision that the appellate court ruled on, hope I can do these off the top of my head, uh, one of them involved uh, worker compensation and whether Prop 22 sort of illegally overrode the state's worker compensation law. Uh, the other was whether the, uh, whether the referendum was specifically designed to handle a single issue, which is part of the law. And the third was a rather complex uh, pathway in Prop 22, how the legislature could amend that, and the question was whether that was unconstitutional too. So the the uh, the, the the court, the, the appellate court, did not rule that the judge was wrong on all three, and then there was a dissent with one of the judges had sided with the other two on some of the rules, but said uh, a third one didn't work and the whole thing should be overturned. So uh, as you can see, it was a rather complex decision. It was like around 130 pages. And um, the end result is that for now, Prop 22 continues to block AB5 from being implemented in California. But the longer term is that, that the, the Supreme Court of the state of California, which I'm sure will take this case, uh, they've got some really big questions ahead of them. I'm trying to connect the dots, and I think there's a hidden joke in this. So AB5 was originally designed to target drivers of Uber and Lyft because of the gig economy. So then Proposition 22 comes out and basically nullifies the original intent of AB5, which was to target the drivers and independent contractors of Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash. Does it feel like maybe trucking has an issue in terms of influence, or were we just kind of stuck holding the bag uh, after other folks politically maneuvered their way out of it? 
Yeah, I, I think so. That that was always been a uh, that's always been a, cr a complaint of the trucking industry. Remember when AB five was first passed, there was this l long grab bag uh, list of. Uh, professions that were exempt from it. There was, there was no rhyme or reason to it. And then they, and then AB5 went into effect, and a lot of other professions started screaming. So the legislature passed another set of exemptions. Uh, I'm not even really sure who's affected by AB5 anymore. Trucking certainly is. And yes, trucking was targeted. Uh, trucking was targeted by AB5, as well as the app-based drivers. Uh, and you know, I mean, the app-based drivers, there's a lot more of them. They had a big, they had big dollars put behind the whole initiative effort by Uber, by Lyft, by DoorDash. Uh, really, there's no one big giant entity in trucking that's going to kind of throw that sort of money at their own uh, problem. Truckers aren't as loved as maybe, maybe the guy who brings you pizza or the guy who, you know, to, who picks you up from a bar afterward in an Uber car so you don't have to drive home drunk. So, uh, yeah, I, there's no doubt about it. There's definitely a different perception and a, and a different basis, but uh, the, the, both those industries were targeted and one so far has found a way out of it. John, one of the things that you mentioned in your article, of course, was and, and just now is that dissent that makes it open to appeal again. Obviously, we're going to go back to court here somewhere at some point. What's the, the, the final resting place? Is this headed to the Supreme Court next, or is there another appellate court in uh, California that this could rise to uh, before you get to the, 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 law, the highest law in the land? No, the, the next level will be the Supreme Court of the state of California, and then the next level after that will be the Supreme Court of the United States. So, I mean, this is, you know, and let, let's remember the original AB5 uh, litigation that led to the injunction that kept AB5 out of the state of California for, you know, two years, um, that was thrown back to the lower court. That has never been adjudicated. The only thing that happened in the lower court level was that on New Year's Eve 2019, an injunction was handed down. That injunction was overturned on appeal in April 2021, but the overturning was stayed. And then finally, you had the Supreme Court of the United States deciding not to uh, not to uh, take the case at the end of June of last year. Uh, so uh, that case Really, the only thing that ever happened in that case was an injunction. Well, an injunction is not the end of the litigation, and that case continues to be litigated today. So who knows what's going to happen with that? Yeah, this is going to be a, a long, long legal battle to, to try and hash out. So obviously in the short term, no impact on trucking, no impact on drivers, no impact on trucking carriers in, in California. Long term, is there anything that they need to be watching out for with regard to how this plays out legally? I mean, I don't, I, I don't really see any legal link at all between truck drivers and Prop 22. Uh, the, the truck drivers in California need to keep their eye on the original litigation, which is the uh, California Trucking Association, and now OIDA is is joined uh, as as a as a as a plaintiff uh, against the state. That is the one that is important. And uh, unless there's some kind of legal tie that I've missed, I, I don't think Prop 22 has any impact at all on the trucking sector. And, you know, looking forward as well, um, so one of the questions I'm kind of curious about is, uh, did this kind of, in your opinion, catch uh, folks like OIDA, ATA, and other carriers off guard in terms of the owner-operators? It feels as though the state of California, through even a lower court, the fifth largest economy, if it were a standalone, is now able to dictate what other states are having to deal with. Do you think that this is going to get sped up, or is the Supreme Court going to punt the ball again? Oh, I'm not sure how to answer that. Uh, I'm not, I, I don't have any... Knowledge. I don't have any knowledge of, of how fast the Supreme Court of the state of California will act on this. Um, I mean, all in all, you know, all in all, really, it's been kind of a year, not even a year and a half, maybe 15, 16 months since Election Day 2020. Things have moved pretty rapidly. Uh, this is a this is a big case. And I would I would imagine the California Supreme Court is going to take this and probably wants to take it somewhat rapidly. This is there are really big issues here. Perfect. Looking forward, uh, I know you have drilling deep as well. Anything you can uh, give us a glimpse on coming up across the wire that you're either writing or you're about to interview for? Well, I still got three stories hanging on from Sierra Week last week. I've already written, I think, four, and I've got three to go. Um, and uh, so we're going to be looking at that. Uh, it, was, it was a great meeting. I know that was what we were originally going to talk about today, Bill, and maybe I can come on some other time. But uh, the, the, the thrust is is really clean fuels and hydrogen and uh, what companies are doing. I've got an interview with uh, that, the very trucking, a couple of interviews that are very trucking specific. Uh, so those are coming up the rest of this week. I got to get through my pile from Houston. 
John, this is obviously a very captivating issue as far as uh, how independent contractors are going to be figured out and defined. It's, it's gone to the federal level, obviously here at the state level. It's going to be something to watch over the course of, well, like you said, not too long ago, probably not within our lifetimes. Yeah, no, I know there's going to be, as, as, as I tweeted last night, many billable hours still out there for attorneys. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, John. Thanks, guys. All right, uh, John Kingston joining us. Of course, Drilling Deep coming up on Fridays at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern, new p noon Pacific time. Uh, a great new show that he's been uh, giving for a couple of months now. Definitely worth checking out. Uh, he def he finds much better guests than I do sometimes, but especially in the oil and gas sector. I always want to check out his work. You are uh, you're going to learn quite a bit, especially in terms of uh, fuel prices, commodities, and what influences it. If you also get the time, you can check out John Kingston's work at FreightWaves.com. He also writes about DOE movements as well as uh, he's going to have some stuff coming up. He went to some events, some conferences, got some uh, spicy content in the works. So definitely check it out. But in the meantime, now for something completely different. We're going to toss it over to the wall with Tony and Donnie for our first look at the carrier update. Welcome into this carrier update. I'm Tony Mulvey, joined by Donnie Gilbert. Donnie, going to start here looking at fuel prices. Seeing again some declines, but they're moderate declines. I mean, we're talking less than a penny a day. The rack prices found some stability, really, for the last what, three weeks, almost a month now? Yeah, so we saw this, you know, this little uptick right through here, mm -hmm. and we were concerned about this pushing fuel prices back up. What was the gap? What was the spread? Yeah. And, of course, it got real close, and we saw it go up one thousandth of a cent. Yep. But it stopped the decline, and if this had gone up any higher, we would have had fuel prices going up again. Yep. But, unfortunately, it did not, and we were able, as you discussed Friday, fuel prices started to go back downhill again. And we've had a few days here again where we're, we're still very, very slowly trending down. Now we talked yesterday about, you know, come the spring or the, the later in the springtime, we got a few months for the peak season for the, the summer times in, in full blown. Uh, and how much further will fuel prices go down? How will it affect rejection rates? Because yeah. this has a lot of pressure on rejection rates for the sheer fact of the fuel surcharges. So if we can, you know, at least come down 40, 50 cents between now and the beginning of the summertime, that's really going to help take a lot of pressure off these carriers. Now, it could also help prolong some of these carriers that are in trouble to kind of hang in there if uh, the NTI stays elevated and these fuel prices come down, and that could prolong this, uh, what we might call the bust end of the cycle. Mm -hmm. We're not in the boom. Yeah. So we might as well call it the bust. <clears throat> and that could extend that. So it, it's, you know, kind of a double-edged sword. Yeah, when I look at this, right, I look over here at the rack price, right? 297, if you've really drew out the average line, it's right at $3 since, what, the first week in February. So we're talking about a dollar forty on that spread. And it's like that that's been that comfort zone really for state retail locations like before it was like a dollar 10 to a dollar 20 yep. now it's up to like a dollar 30 to a dollar 40 just given this this volatility that we see in their cost at the rack price they're wanting to make sure that they can offset some of this volatility by holding those margins a little larger right it's not that they're trying to make a bunch of money on fuel they're just not wanting to get squeezed where that and lose a lot of money on where the that world. spread goes to 80 cents right and now it's costing them 20 cents a gallon in, sure. in cost let's look at that spread dollar <clears throat> 40 i almost said dollar 41 so you were you were dead on tony and you're right when we see it now before we talked about where i drew a line between like 90 cents and 110 mm -hmm. and when the spread hit in that area we saw price, prices go up well that has been moved up and we need to go back and evaluate it again and kind of see where we think they are but you're right because of the volatility they're they're not willing to let it get that close anymore they're they're letting it down about a dollar 25 dollar 35 and then we're seeing fuel prices kick up because they don't want, they don't want to get caught with the prices being too low yeah it's a similar concept to what you see on like a cpg on the cpg front right they let inflation kind of take its toll on their end but now it's getting to the point where hey our margins are so thin that we have to raise prices at stores and it's kind of this it, it's a phenomenon that happens across all businesses, really. But, I mean, you can see it in those comparisons. 
this margin gets too thin, it's like we have to raise the price because our cost or what we're charging isn't enough to offset what it's costing us per gallon, yeah. right? And obviously, fuel isn't their money maker, but they doesn't want to be a loss leader either. Exactly, good, good, good line there, loss leader. All right, next chart here. Uh, you can pull this up on on a, on a U.S. map. I love doing this because it allows you to see where the cheapest fuel is, and, and as you get further away from this central central Texas, or Texas and central Oklahoma, you see fuel prices start to increase slowly the further out you get. And of course, competing for the highest fuel markets in the U.S., we have the Northeast and we have California. Yep. But I believe Fresno is gonna be the winner today at an average of 566. Yeah, and some of those are the highest tax states on that fuel too, right? That's why like you look up in Maine and areas like that, it's not as high as what it is in New York. Well, it's some of that is difference in taxes in the two. Like the actual fuel price is close, but it is like you said, it's New York and it's California. Yep. Highest prices. Yep. So, but when we come back, Tony, we're going to jump in and look at some, some data on dry vans. Awesome stuff. Thank you, Donnie. As always, right now, we'll hand it over to Thomas Waston with a look at this morning's headlines. Thank you, Tony. I'm Thomas Watson. It's time to read the news. Retail diesel prices have continued their downward march with the benchmark used for most fuel surcharges dropping for the sixth week in a row. The Department of Energy Energy Information Administration price declined 3.5 cents a gallon to $4.24. It was the sixth consecutive week the price had declined, falling 21.2 cents a gallon during that time. Longer term, the price has been down 16 of the past 20 weeks, coming off a price of $5.34 a gallon on October 24th. This is a $1.09 a gallon decline during that time. In other news, British Airways has substituted wide-body passenger aircraft on more than two dozen short-haul flights in Europe, normally carried out by single-aisle jets to accommodate extra demand for cargo, parent company International Airlines Group confirmed. The airline is flying Boeing 777-200, 777-300s, and 787-900 jets on certain routes from London Heathrow Airport between January and April, said John Cheatham, Chief Commercial Officer at IAG Cargo, the cargo handling division for British Airways, Iberia, Aer Lingus, Vueling, and Lovell. Wide-body aircraft, especially the 777, can hold much more cargo in their lower hold than standard passenger jets. <coughs> Also, UPS and FedEx Corp have begun to take market share from their regional parcel delivery rivals by leveraging generous discounts on price, according to sources. Share taking between regional and national carriers is nothing new. However, the aggressiveness of the national carriers is different than it has been in the past, the sources said. Among shippers who've defected According to a top regional carrier source are Gap Inc., Williams Sonoma Inc., French retailer Sephora, a unit of LVMH, and Nordstrom Inc. According to one of the sources, much of today's shifting is playing out in a climate of excess capacity, a scenario not seen since before the pandemic. The level of switching wouldn't be as high if markets were tighter. Now, you can find these stories and much more on FreightWaves.com and on our app. And if you're watching us on that YouTube channel, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, log on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. That's a wrap for the first segment of the news, but don't touch that dial. Folks, we're going to take a quick break and be back with more content. Do you want to watch the weirdest show in Freight? your Nooner with Dooner right here on FreightWave TV live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern time or on video on demand and podcast players whenever you got to scratch that itch.
If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, TIE-TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with TIE's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, TIE saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at tie-software.com. Join FreightWaves live webinar series, The State of Freight. Each month, Craig Fuller, FreightWaves founder and CEO, and Zach Strickland, head of market intelligence, will cover the current state of the freight market, share industry expertise, and offer critical insights that were previously made available only to subscribers of FreightWaves supply chain analytics and high-frequency data platform, Sonar. Watch FreightWaves State of Freight live monthly webinar series. Register at FreightWaves.com slash events to reserve your place now. Welcome to Drilling Deep. I'm your host, John Kingston. Drilling Deep is the place where we talk about oil and we talk about diesel and you have to drill to get oil and you have to get oil to make diesel. So that's why we call it Drilling Deep. Drilling Deep drops every Friday on FreightWaves TV and all available podcast platforms. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and this is Social Roundabout, where we take a look at what's trending on social media. Now, the first thing I want to talk about is an article that you can find on backthetruckup.com, and they're talking about a speed enforcement blitz that's going to be taking place on US-20. That is going to be today. Now, that is going to take place in states New York, Iowa, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, which we're still not sure that exists, and Pennsylvania. So, if you're in those states, make sure that you are watching your speed because they're going to be both marked and unmarked vehicles. So just make sure that you're watching your speed, not going over that speed limit because you don't want to get a ticket. Now I'm going to switch things up just a little bit and we're going to talk about a little bit of Taylor Swift because she's going to be performing or starting her Eras tour in Glendale, Arizona, or should I say Swift City. They have renamed the city to Swift City. It will be on Friday, March 17th and Saturday. Uh, March 18th, and so the city, since Taylor is starting her tour there, decided to rename the city Swift City, which I think is actually really cool. So all of the Swifties will be, I'm sure, storming to State Farm Arena to watch her and Paramore perform. So, Lindell, you're doing good. You're doing good things out there. Keep it up. That's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout. Right now, I'm going to toss things over to Bill and Thomas. All right, thank you very much, Isaiah. That benefit, I think, was for uh, Craig Fuller because obviously he's a huge Taylor Swift fan there, too. Well, also, it kind of ties in. The, the trucks don't want to be in Swift City. You can't go too fast, you get pulled over, but you can instead go to the Taylor Swift concert. Possibly there as well. Let's bring in our next live guest. Peter Rentschler joins us, CEO of Metaphora, uh, out in Boulder, Colorado. Peter, how you doing? Hey, Bill, I'm great. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm great. Uh, how are you? Uh, hanging in there quite well, sir. Let's talk about building a uh, highly functional software team because this is something that, uh, you know, when you've got to get, get something done and you want to get something done effectively, you've got an interesting take on this. So how do you develop a highly uh, functional software team within your own business if you want to do that? Yeah, so this is something that's been highly debated over the last, uh, I mean, really kind of a uh, couple decades. Um, and with so much technology in the space today, so many businesses are investing heavily in their technology and, 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 and thinking about how do they build out really effective teams. Um, and, and one of the things that's been a, a highly debated topic is what's the right mix of U.S.-based W-2 full-time employees versus nearshore and offshore contractors. Um, I, I can tell you personally, at, at one point, our business had entirely W-2-based technology teams and, and U.S.-based teams, and it, it ended up being incredibly expensive. And so, you know, fundamentally, hybrid software development teams combine in-house and outsourced nearshore or offshore talent for greater flexibility and efficiency. It allows businesses to quickly scale up or down based on 
on the demands of their business, the growth demands of their business and broader market conditions. Um, it allows them to, to use the latest and greatest technologies and tools to enhance their operations where you can pull in expertise from different parts of the country or different, or different parts of the world or different partners. Um, it, also allows, it also allows technology teams to continue working in different time zones um, where you almost have like a, you know, you've got kind of the U.S.-based and nearshore teams working and then, and then they hand off at night to maybe a, a European or an Asian-based team that allows you to continue working around the clock and ultimately deliver higher quality software at a lower cost. And talking about the differences in what to look for, uh, when you have a team of W2, you've got a lot of control. Uh, would you recommend, uh, is that something where having an outsourced foreign or would you want to also look into H-1B visas uh, in terms of practicality? What are some ways or what are some green flags and red flags you should look out for if you're looking to make the switch from a pure play uh, W2 situation? Yeah, it's a great question because language barriers is, can obviously be a, a challenge. Um, you know, the H-1B process has changed, changes really depending on, on the, um, the administration that's in place. You know, when, when Trump was in office, um, I, we personally looked at, at, at H-1B visas. We even looked at having some of our, 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 our offshore um, team members come and just get temporary 90-day work visas. And even those were incredibly difficult to get a hold of. Um, they've loosened some of that under, under the Biden administration, but I think as you're planning a long-term strategy, it, it can certainly be a risky play. Um, you know, there's certainly benefit to trying to find, um, you know, formerly, you know, developers or, or technologists that maybe started their careers overseas and then have moved to the U.S. and have already gotten their green card and are, and are, are U.S. citizens now. Um, but, you know, to your point around green flags and red flags, um, it is definitely worth noting that you need a different type of, of U.S.-based onshore kind of core team to manage these, these offshore developers. Um, that's something that we've found over the last couple of years as we've refined our own business model to, uh, to allow for that kind of same quality or higher quality output at a lower, at a lower cost to our customers is ultimately that you there there is a difference between kind of a really strong US based engineer senior engineer versus a really strong US based senior engineer that that also knows how to manage offshore teams it's a different philosophy it's less about being the absolute best technologist or architect and more about being um, really kind of a people person that's effective at managing work and 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 allocation of that work Peter, this is really interesting stuff, especially when you just kind of trying to figure out how you can work a hybrid system together and make it work. What are perhaps some of the metrics that you would use to try and measure success in, in making sure that obviously things are working efficiently, even though you've got a team in-house working with people that are, that are outside of your building or outside of your organization? Yeah, you know, I love, I love a good metrics question, so I appreciate, I appreciate it. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the, the number one is is going to be um, cost, the the kind of the the two most obvious ones, I suppose, that that correlate are cost relative to velocity of the team, and velocity is how many points or how many stories are um, are that t is that team delivering on a on a per sprint basis, and you want to see that velocity increasing over time. It's worth noting that that when you first put in these new teams, just like any team coming together, their, their performance is not going to be high, high efficiency from day one, but you want to see a steady uh, growth curve on the velocity of the, of the business um, or on the velocity of the team. And that's where we've, we've actually seen since implementing this strategy for our own business, we've seen our, our teams with anywhere from a 20 to 50% increase in velocity from the team um, as, as we as we move to this hybrid model and as we deploy it at our clients, that's also something that we've seen is that our, our teams tend to perform on average anywhere from 20 to 50% higher velocity and um, for the same size and cost of team to what our, our clients are, are using. And so th those are really kind of the, the two key metrics. Beyond that, you can start to look at things like um, number, number of bugs that are in the code every time it's submitted, how, how long, um, how long does it take to close out those bugs? How, how frequently 
is the team deploying code? Are they, is there a continuous improve, a CI CD pipeline, continuous improvement, conti or, um, continuous integration, continuous delivery pipeline where, where you're pushing code on a weekly basis or potentially even a daily basis? Or is it more like, hey, we're, built, we're building a bunch and we're pushing it all once a month or once a quarter and then a bunch of, of stuff breaks? Um, and then obviously, you know, as you start to look further downstream, in, ter uh -oh. in terms, as you start to look further downstream in terms, I was like, wow, that's a fun, uh, am I getting cut off? Like, the, I know the Oscars were earlier this that's week. That's our Oscar music. Um, <laughs> we afford the yeah, music. Kidding. So, yeah, that's, yeah, that's some fun Oscar music. So, um, but the last point I'll just make is that as you look further downstream, once the code gets pushed, I would look at the average number of support tickets um, that are put out there as well. And, and, and specifically kind of the, how technical are the support issues, um, in nature? Like if, if you have a, a team that that's constantly pushing out code, but it's also generating an, an, uh, an, an, an uptick of support tickets from customers every time, then they're, they might be low performing. Final thoughts here as well. We've actually have about two minutes, so we were premature on the Oscar music, but <laughs> looking at, <laughs> we've got the team assembled, we've got the game plan. Two things I really like, I came from trucking and little systems, legacy systems and tech debt. How should you even think about it? What are some pragmatic steps? What should folks from a high level think about when they try to eat this elephant? We need more people talking about tech debt, so I love that. Um, so, so leg legacy systems can be challenging because oftentimes um, it, it can be hard to find nearshore and offshore partners that have experience working in those. For what it's worth, that is where working with um, an outside agency or a firm that has a specialization in the transportation space can really come in handy because oftentimes they have, ex you know, folks like my, my team have experience working with with those um, with those legacy technologies, but tech debt specifically is actually a really can be a really great starting point for testing out these hybrid teams, um, where you take maybe one one or two of your of your existing W two U S based onshore engineers, maybe a senior engineer and an intermediate engineer, and you pair them up with a team of nearshore or offshore devs and have them tackle tech debt. Um, oftentimes tech debt is not kind of sexy. It can be challenging to find engineers that want to work on it, but, but it's also, as it's called debt for a reason, it's, it's, it's work that has to be done and that has to be paid off, um, as, as you made decisions to, to push product out quicker earlier in the software development life cycle. And so, you know, that can be, that, that tech debt is actually a really great place to start with 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 testing out hybrid teams and getting those offshore and near shore or the offshore and near shore contractors and developers really comfortable working in your technology stack without them focused on pushing out new code um, or working on on net new initiatives it can be a little bit of a lower risk initiative or engage or uh, project for them to work on Peter, I wish we had a lot more time to talk about it. Unfortunately, we've got to play you off here uh, and uh, <laughs> head, to, head on to our to our next segment. But thanks so much. This is come back again because we've got I've got a lot more questions I'd like to ask you on this particular subject. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me on. As always, love it. All right, Peter Richard, CEO of Metaphora, joining us here from Boulder, Colorado, and uh, we're going to take a short break. We'll come back with a whole lot more freight waves now after this. freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, Thai TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with Thai's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, Thai saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at thai-software.com. 
guests come to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. June. This is Thomas Watson, Enterprise Trucking Carrier Expert here at Freight Waves, telling you about my show, Loaded and Rolling. Now, it involves trucking topics for large carriers and even small ones that wish to be large. Anything that impacts trucking, you can get it there. You can catch us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on tv.freightwaves.com. We do it live. Welcome back to Freight Waves. Now, Donnie, going to start here talking about what's going on in the drive-in market. going to start by looking, though, at what's going on with spot rates, seeing, again, further downward movement, which is not a yes. positive sign. No, and here, the blue line is the actual daily. Yep. And that's the one that I look at, because I want to see what's going on daily. But yesterday, or sorry, two days ago was the 12th, which was a Sunday. But I gave it one more day and it didn't look too, too much better. So, you know, here we're running around that, you know, 235, 240 range. Been pretty steady for yeah. a few weeks here. And then, boom, it drops all the way down to like 227. Yeah. Now, the green line, that's a seven-day rolling average. The past two or three days on the seven-day rolling average, we've seen it go 237. 236, 235. It's working its way down. And when this, some of these high points right here get... Out of that seven day rolling average, you're gonna see it drop down more. Now we predicted it would drop 10, 12 cents during the month of March. Mm -hmm. And now we haven't dropped that much, thank goodness, but it is on its way down and we will see it continue to drop here as we get through the next few days. Now what we saw though was an 11 cent decline day over day from Sunday to Monday, or no, from Saturday to Sunday, right? Yeah. And so. then it only came back about four, four cents. right? So, and typically when we see these swings, right? Like you don't really see a lot of sustained moves in. Here's another one. Yeah, right? And then one day back up and then another day down. And these peaks are hitting the bottoms. Mm -hmm. Well, and my point being, if we only pick back up to 231, like if we see tomorrow, like it comes on the way back down again, like we're setting up this pretty rapid decline here in that seven day moving average, because when you think about it, that would have been three of the seven days that are below what it is, so. Yeah, so we are we could very well drop, you know, we're, we're gonna, and it may not fall 15 cents, yeah. but we're, we're looking to at least have a good seven, eight cent downward plunge this month, which is still on the, for the, for the average, it's a pretty big loss. Yeah, for sure. And it's really going to put a hurt, especially when you take the fuel out of it. And here, the other day, it was, a, I think, $1.68, uh -huh. so probably $1.67 now. Without fuel, that is, that's in that area where it's below some people's operating or break even and just above some of the others. Yep. And that's where they're going to operate so long and end up being out of business. Uh -huh. So we are at that point. <clears throat> All right, let's go and switch gears and go to the next chart. All right, drive vans. I promise you some drive vans, and it, it's not looking very pretty either. No. This is not going to help this NTI. We're seeing uh, volumes trend down right now. Now, hopefully, after about the 15th, we'll see them trend back up. But we normally see a downward trend in March, and we still normally start March with higher volumes than we end March with. But also, this is, you know, we, we had a good upward trend, call it a trend. Over a few weeks, it went up about a half a percent, but it was, at least it was not going down. And here it started to turn back down just a little bit for rejection rates. So both of them are now kind of turning downward, but, you know, rejection rates are very low for driving at 3.35. 
and volumes are at 7,253. If you look at OTVI, we want to be above 10,000. Mm -hmm. Well, we're at 10,300. So we got a little bit a ways to go before this pushes us below the 10,000 mark, but I don't want to see that. Yeah, what I'm looking at is up there at the top, the 1% day over day decline. Like that is a big movement in volume levels. Like you start having, you piggyback a couple of those declines, it goes from above 10,000 on the overall to below it very quickly. Very quickly. And this could happen this week if this continues as you say exactly. <clears throat> now let's look at some of these changes here in rejection rates. We're starting to see a lot of movement here. We still see some red, we see a lot of blues as well. Uh, some of them are in the, the bigger markets. We got Nashville. Uh, we got, you know, a lot of Texas for these, a lot of rural markets. A lot we have of El Paso. Border. Yep, Laredo and uh, El Paso. Um, Northern Louisiana here, uh, we see some, some markets picking up uh, and Salt Lake City. So we see some that are moving around. So keep an eye on these. These are, like I say, we, you know, we have rejection rates going down in Memphis, but here they're holding steady in Atlanta. Now, of course, holding steady, they're all in that 3% range, but always keep an eye on what is moving. That might help you make decisions on where you need to put your trucks. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. We'll be sure to check in with you one more time, or in the second hour. Two more times in the second hour. Right now, we'll hand it back over to Bill and Thomas. All right, thank you very much, guys. Time now to jump back into our community segment. It's Check Call, and that means Mary O'Connell joins us from St. Louis. Mary, how you doing? I'm good this morning, guys. How are you? Excellent. All right, so when you look at, uh, we're looking at a couple of different aspects here during our segment here, and, and you have ArcBest. The, the, the uh, I guess the rumor mill has been out there for a while. Mark Solomon wrote about it. Uh, all of a sudden there's, there's, there's rumblings in the water. What are you hearing? And, and, and maybe what can we talk about without speculating too much about what might possibly happen? Um, so as we all know, the best, most reliable source to get all of your rumor gossip mill is Twitter. Um, and it's 100% reliable and Twitter's never wrong. But um, no, the, the reality is, is that, um, you know, ArcBest did just acquire Molo and uh, in what I didn't know was a surprise to the founders of Molo. Um, I thought it was just like, oh, you know, a couple of years after a company buys another one, typically, you know, the founders of one kind of disappear and it's all very part of the agreement. Um, apparently that was not the case this time as we found through some very public LinkedIn posts and, um, um, you know, the founders of Molo were just as surprised as all of us. So that is not typically a good sign. Um, but through some of the actions that ArcBest is taking, they are kind of almost pre preparing themselves to be a very attractive buy. So they are putting themselves in a position to be bought and um, potentially, um, this is all just my own speculation slash what I have found on the internet, um, not confirmed through ArcBest in any way, shape, or form, but um, it appears as though they are attempting to make themselves in a good position to be bought through someone. Um, and the most likely candidate is TFI as they recently bought UPS, and that is a um, a union, a company that understands a union, and ArcBest is union, uh, their drivers and everything. Um, and someone that does, a company that doesn't understand unions is not going to even touch a company that has a union because for people who have not worked in unions, they are very, it's very delicate and you can mess with a lot of contracts and you can be in violation of a lot of contracts if you're not familiar with how unions work. So, um, typically the best, you don't want to start your union adventure with a multi-million to almost a billion dollar sale. So, um, I would not surprise me if in the coming months that TFI does make a offer to buy ArcBest. Um, but, uh, that would, I mean, we're just kind of on a wait and see there. Um, but typically in a recessionary or a down market, you'll see a lot of these acquisitions through carriers, um, just kind of, you know, 
coming together, becoming Omega Carrier, and then moving on with their life just because it makes it a little easier to weather that storm when you have a bigger, um, when you buy someone that will bring in more revenue. Well, it feels fascinating, the sudden firing of uh, the executives and like one of the founders of Molo. Uh, usually when companies decide to part ways after they do a buyout, it's on a lot happier terms. Are we looking at a little bit of palace intrigue here, or do you think that there's more to the story, or just simply a series of unfortunate events? The optimist in me says it's just a series of unfortunate events, um, but the realist in me says that there's probably something else there, but we'll never know because, you know, we're not in those meetings, we're not in, um, we're not sitting in any of those things, and what we ha- what we do know, the facts that we do have, which is, um, you know, LinkedIn posts from the founders of Molo, and not a lot of comment from arc best um is that you know it probably was just a a business decision that had to be made to position themselves for a stronger future so i'm not exactly sure how letting the founders of molo go plays into a strategy of getting bought but i'm sure arc best had a reason for it because i'm sure it was probably very expensive to let them go (laughs) I have a follow-up on that. It reminds me of back in the day when a company called Coyote got bought by a company called UPS. And an interesting situation was that there was a giant flight of talent away with brokerages. The secret sauce lies in the people. Thinking about the impacts of this, uh, do you think that we may see additional talent outflows or do you think the ship has been righted and it is now ripe for purchase? Um, I think that, well, I mean, because this all just happened last, like late last week. So I would not be surprised if we see a lot of Molo um, employees abandon the Arc Best ship, um, just because I know the culture at Molo was so strong and it was something that attracted a lot of people, helped in the retention of employees. And I know that the founders were pretty instrumental in developing that culture. So um, it would not surprise me if there was some turnover, but you'll always have turnover when you make moves like this. So I think Arc Best would have accounted for it. Um, I just personally, I think that the turnover will be quite high, but I could be wrong. Again, I I have no aggressive data to block to, to support me. <laughs> Mary, as you look at this situation, one of the things that, I mean, obviously ArcBest is, is a big name. It's a household name in freight, uh, especially in, in trucking. Uh, if this were to go through, or if, 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 if a purchase to anyone were to go through uh, at this point, what kind of effect do you think that has perhaps on other acquisitions or just within the freight market? Um, I mean, it'll be, I don't want to say that there won't be that much change overall to a freight market. It just might be just some reshuffling of various markets and just a reshuffling of a network um, between whoever purchases ArcBest and ArcBest. But I don't see it as something that is going to massively disrupt um, a network. For example, when... um, like New England Motor Freight went out of business a couple of years ago. That's not going to, it's not going to have that same effect where suddenly you're scrambling to find carriers in the Northeast. I think it'll be a couple week adjustment as the buyer kind of grabs their hands around the business and goes through and understands what that book of business is because ArcBest has such a, has such a reputation with their customers of doing such a good job and um you know they have a loyal customer base so i think any prospective buyer will walk in knowing that they want to keep that customer base and they want to keep them happy so i think there will be minimal disruptions to the network um it just there might be you know that traditional month or two months a couple of shipments get lost here and there as they you know work to get everything um on one system and you know just kind of everything flowing through the new systems correctly i think it'll just be a little bit of a hiccup but nothing too bad final thoughts here a little over two minutes left looking at non-competes a passion project or a tool of control by oppressive brokers what are what's going on right now ftc we got some moves potentially 
So yes, the FTC actually um, extended their deadline. It was supposed to be, uh, all comments were supposed to be in, I believe, this week. They extended the deadline. I think they've got something over like 7,000 comments on there. And it's everything from doctors, nurses, um, to freight brokers, to lawyers. It's like, it's everything. And like, um, I want to say there's like one in three people under that make under third, that make like $13 an hour are affected by a non-compete and it's it's just it's absolutely ridiculous i um it's not really a secret that i'm not the biggest fan of them um and so and so if if the ftc ruling gets caught in litigation or anything like that with the supreme court there is actually some bipartisan support for banning non-competes so i think if the ftc ruling kind of gets shot down um we'll see something come out of congress that says that maybe supports it i mean it's already banned in certain states i think there's like 10 states that ban them so it's very difficult to um you know apply or to enforce in certain states like california north dakota etc um and so i'm just kind of excited to see what happens ideally i would like it to not get caught in litigation however i know there are some people with some pretty big pockets that would like to um you know challenge it that ruling yeah, we had Randy Mullet on uh, not too long ago when this issue came up, when the FTC uh, made their announcement that they were at least going to be looking into this. And he said, uh, and, and uh, I think every, he's right, and from what uh, I've heard from other people, they've said that he's absolutely right, that the trade unions are going to fight this tooth and nail. So this is going to be an incredible battle on a legal front. Uh, this is not just a simple rulemaking. <laughs> that's, that's just going to fly right through. Uh, there is a way. Um, gut reaction, what do you think is, is, is the end result? I mean, obviously, this could go on for years, but what do you think will be the end result? Do we get rid of non-competes completely? Real quick. I think not. I think not through the FTC ruling. I think maybe through a bipartisan um, bill ruling. That's how it gets going. Um, but I think there's enough support that it really just needs the people now that are affected through non competes to voice their opinion and say um, their piece. So that way we can hopefully ban them forever. I will always want to ban them. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Mary, got check call coming up as well. Any new guests and uh, what time can folks watch it? Yeah, today um, we actually break down the legal side of non-competes and we talk more about the ArcBest um, Molo deal. And then um, you can watch it today at 1230. Just keep watching FreightWaves TV. Do not switch off. Um, and then you'll also have the newsletter come out today at 2 o'clock as well. Perfect. Mary, thanks so much for coming on. Looking forward to hearing more about how this develops. That's going to be a wrap for today. You can also catch Mary O'Connell with Running on Ice, one of the other communities we have a focus on cold chain. We'll see you on Friday. On Friday, yes. And they have a corresponding newsletter, so check them out for sure. That's going to be a wrap for this segment. We're going to be taking a quick break, and then we'll return back with more. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call, Check Call, Check Call, Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, okay. Is pizza what an open face it? sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet. If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, Thai TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with Thai's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, Thai saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at thai-software.com.
Welcome back to Freight Waves Now, everyone. I'm Ozzy Buchanan, and this is Social Roundabout. And we've all heard about the Silicon Valley Bank losing all of their money. And there's a TV show that somehow is always able and to predict when big events happen in the real world. And that's The Simpsons. Take a look at this clip from their show. <laughs> what do you mean the bank is out of money? Insolvent? You only have enough cash for the next three customers! <laughs> your money here. It's in Bill's house and, and, and Fred's house. Hey, what the hell are you doing? My money in your house, Fred. Now, I'm sure that's not exactly how it happened. I mean, the domino effect of everybody freaking out was kind of a trend that we saw with that because there was a bank in New York that also had a lot of issues as well. But it seems to be leveling out again. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to share that clip with y'all. I thought it was kind of funny. The Simpsons always, there's always something relatable to The Simpsons in that show that's happened in the real world, whether they're predicting something or whatever the case may be. Well, coming up this weekend is one of the, it's a big holiday, St. Patrick's Day. And one of my favorite traditions is Chicago turning their river green. You always see these other places maybe do a fountain or something like that, but Chicago turns a portion of their river green. This is a time-lapse video from the Chicago Tribune showing boats driving by, dropping the dye into the river to turn it this bright neon green color. This is one of the best St. Patrick's Day traditions, in my opinion, and it draws a very large crowd. St. Uh, Chicago actually has one of the biggest St. Patrick's Day parades outside of Dublin, which of course is in Ireland, so it would be kind of hard to top that. But I just wanted to show y'all that video from the Chicago Tribune um, and one of the greatest traditions for St. Patrick's Day. Make sure you wear your green so you don't get pinched. That's all I have for this edition of Social Roundabout. Right now, I'm going to toss things back over to Bill and Thomas. Thank you very much, Isaiah. And uh, looking at what's coming up, we got a big event coming up tomorrow. That's why Tony Mulvey's standing in here. And uh, Tony, uh, what is going on tomorrow? Yeah, so tomorrow we've got our Supply Chain Meets FinTech Summit. So the idea of bridging the gap between supply chain technology and FinTech technology, obviously that financial technology and finance in general has been in the news. Mm -hmm. Maybe for all the wrong reasons yeah. in the past week or so, but taking a look at what's going on in the two major, like big high focus areas for venture capital over the past, say, 10, 12 years. And now you're starting to see some of these companies mature. So it's a look at how VCs' appetites for these are, how nearshoring, and those are playing an impact because we do have a lot of. Areas of this Latin America, Mexico, uh, cross-border trade, how these, this bridge between the two technologies can impacts overall that, that cross-border trade. A reminder, you can register for that, live.freightwaves.com, and also you can be registered for a uh, free giveaway, a uh, cooler that we'll be giving away there as well. Yeah, so when you register, you're automatically signed up to win that free Yeti cooler. So go ahead, go get registered. It is free. There's that networking opportunity. There's also going to be a live What the Truck during the event. Yeah. So should be a good one. All day. Great information coming up tomorrow. We'll take a look at the last 24 hours in freight with our market update next.
show and freight. Catch your Nooner with Dooner right here on FreightWave TV live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern time or on video on demand and podcast players whenever you got to scratch that itch. If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, Thai TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with Thai's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, Thai saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at thai-software.com. Join FreightWave's live webinar series, The State of Freight. Each month, Craig Fuller, FreightWave's founder and CEO, and Zach Strickland, head of market intelligence, will cover the current state of the freight market, share industry expertise, and offer critical insights that were previously made available only to subscribers of FreightWave's supply chain analytics and high-frequency data platform, Sonar. Watch FreightWave's State of Freight live monthly webinar series. Register at FreightWave.com slash events to reserve your place now. And with your full check of headlines, I'm Bill Priestley. British Airways has substituted wide-body passenger aircraft on more than two dozen short-haul flights in Europe, normally carried out by single-aisle jets to accommodate extra demand for cargo, parent company International Airlines Group confirmed. The airline is flying Boeing 777-200, and 787-900 jets on certain routes from London's Heathrow Airport between January and April, said John Cheatham, Chief Commercial Officer at IAG Cargo. The car Cargo Handling Division for British Airways, Iberia, Aer Lingus, Vueling, and Level. Wide-body aircraft, especially the 777, can hold much more cargo in the lower hold than standard passenger jets. UPS and FedEx Corporation have begun to take market share from their regional pace delivery rivals by leveraging generous price discounts, according to sources. Share take tagging between regional and national carriers is nothing new. However, the aggressiveness of the national carriers is different than it has been in the past, the source said. Among shippers who have detected and defected, excuse me, according to a top regional carrier source, are Gap Incorporated, Williams Sonoma, French retailer Sephora, a unit of LVMH, and Nordstrom. According to one of the sources, much of today's shifting is playing out in a climate of excess capacity, a scenario not seen since before the pandemic. The level of switching wouldn't be as high if markets were tighter, according to the source. Norfolk Southern has, reject, has reached sick leave agreements with two more unions, with approximately 650 employees being affected. The agreements are with the International uh, the agreements are with the International Association of Sheet Metal Air Rail Transportation Workers, Mechanical Department, and the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, according to NS's news release. Both unions had re, had also re, reached. Uh, sick leave agreements with Western U.S. Railroad BNSF. The agreement calls for to step up to seven paid sick days per year for members. There will be four new days of paid sick leave, plus an option to use up to three additional days of paid existing of existing paid time off as sick leave. Norfolk Southern said on Friday. 
Proposition 22, which kept California's independent contractor law AB5 from applying to app-based drivers uh, like those from Uber and DoorDash, has been kept alive by a state appellate court ruling in a decision that lays the groundwork for an appeal because the three-judge panel did not fully agree on the issues. The Court of Appeal for the First Appellate District reversed the core of an earlier decision that Prop 22 was unconstitutional in exempting app-based workers, app workers from AB5. That lower court decision from August 2021 was stayed, and at base workers, mostly drivers, continue to work without being impacted by the more restrictive independent contractor definitions of AB5. And Navistar Incorporated is reliving for a third time a recall of medium and heavy duty trucks experiencing engine revving that can overwhelm the parking brake and lead to unintended movement. Uh, the, the Lyle, Illinois based manufacturer and Tratton Group subsidiary is recalling nearly 30,000 international HV and MV trucks from the 2022 to 24 model years and IC bus TC commercial buses from the 22 to 23 model years sold in the US and Canada. All of the recall vehicles could experience the issue. Navistar reported no crashes or injuries. And you can find these stories and more on FreightWaves.com and on our app. And if you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to give us a like and subscribe to stay updated. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, log on to TV.FreightWaves.com. Now back over to the wall for our next carrier update. Welcome to this carrier update. Don, I'm going to start here talking about the head haul index. So it's the difference between outbound volumes and inbound volumes, positive numbers indicating head haul markets, negative numbers indicating back haul markets. No surprise when you look at some of these, like Florida, you see severe back haul markets, whereas up north in Atlanta, head haul market. But little interesting stuff here on the West Coast mainly because you'd think Ontario, California is a head haul market, and it probably is, but there's not a lot of inbound, or there's, I guess there's a lot of inbound freight going in there, but it's going from LA in there and then outbound from there. So how about this? Let's not say uh, head haul or back haul markets. Let's use overbooked or underbooked. Yep. And overbooked meaning, or uh, overbooked meaning there are more tr uh, loads than there are trucks. Yep. So there's not enough supply of trucks to carry the demand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Underbook meaning there are more trucks in the market than there are loads. Yep. Meaning that's uh, too much, too many trucks in the market. Mm -hmm. So, yes, Ontario is a head haul market. Always will be. Yep. But right now it's underbooked. Now LAX is overbooked. Phoenix overbooked. So when you have a blue market surrounded by a bunch of red markets, we do not take into account deadhead on these mm -hmm. on this overbooked and underbooked. Trucks will migrate from here into these markets. So LAX, is it truly a head haul market right now? <coughs> probably not. It's probably pretty close to either break even or maybe even loose a little bit. Uh, too many trucks. So be careful when you see the blues around the, mm -hmm. a bunch of red around the blues. Uh, now we have Fort Worth here, or uh, Dallas. Fort Worth is a little bit underbooked. You have Houston, which is uh, almost even here. Uh, these are probably some, some decent markets, a little bit on the overbooked side. Uh, Memphis, you got some blues around Memphis, so this could be a market that's uh, tightening up. Uh, same with Atlanta. Atlanta, blue, 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 blue. Uh, lots of blue around Atlanta, so this market could be tightening up. Chicago, or Joliet, it's got some reds around it. It's probably mm -hmm. going to suck in that capacity. So, but still, we say run to the blue because these blue markets are going to be the better markets that will help keep your truck rolling or will have opportunities. Yep. Now, so more again, more volume than there are trucks in the market at yeah. the time. Now, this does not mean the pricing is going to be better necessarily. Yep. These are markets or maybe you larger carriers who really just need to keep those miles on those drivers, keep those trucks rolling. These are the markets that you need to aim for so you can pick something up quick and continue right driving on. If you're uh, picking up a load and delivering to a blue market, don't expect the rate to be very strong. Yep. If you're going blue to red, you that's better make you sure that's a better rate. If it's not a good rate, then you need to walk away. Yep. Uh, but when you go into the red market, understand your, your driver might be sitting for several hours, maybe even the next till the next morning before he gets his next load. Yep. Uh, it can be a lot more difficult, or they're going to have to take a cheap rate to get out of there, mm -hmm. or both. So plan on that, and then you can price it uh, appropriately. Like they say, there's there's um, there's no bad lanes in trucking. 
There's yeah. just bad rates. Yeah, the old saying that goes way back from, uh, I've heard it for 25 years. So, but yes, that's very true though, and it still holds true. So try to use maps like these or the change maps. Figure out what's popping up in blue on the change maps. Yeah, try and then use it with this, right? Use them together. Blue. Yes, and so here, uh, I'm gonna look at Memphis here. I'm also gonna look at Nashville in our lanes today. Nashville is not blue here, but it popped up very blue on the change map from week to week. Yeah, we'll move here to looking at that Nashville market, you can see why it popped up blue in yeah. on the rejection rate because we went from 2% to 5.5% in a matter of a couple days. Yes, so here we see a big increase in rejection. Something is going on in the Nashville market. Yep. Uh, and of course, this shows us the rejection rate. So we have some tightening. We have, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's weather because they didn't get a bunch of snow or ice. Yeah. So this could just be a market playing out. And when you see rejection rates going up like this, it could mean that, you know, you can put some <laughs> upward pressure on these prices if you're doing spot market. Yeah. And of course, if trucking companies don't see this or don't realize this, they could miss out yeah. on those opportunities. Like you said, it's, it's finding the opportunities. Now, now you have to take advantage of that data and understanding of those opportunities. Exactly. Awesome stuff. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for this update. Right now, we'll hand it back over to Thomas Watson. Thank you, gentlemen. Super excited to be welcoming our next guest for this segment. It is Phil Schmidbauer, VP of Engineering Solutions with ODW Logistics out of Cincinnati. Phil, welcome, sir. Hey, thank you for having me. So talking about topic of the day, retail compliance and how to adhere to compliance programs. For those of us on the other fringes of the supply chain, well, what is retail compliance? Well, um, if you think about when you go into a retail store, Thomas, like you want to make sure there's product. If you're going to find something, you want to make sure it's there and available, right? So retail compliance on the opposite end for uh, a lot of our customers are we're delivering into Walmart's warehouse, right? They have compliance fees where if you're not on time, um, and you're not, your product isn't in full for what they've ordered for them to replenish their stores, then there's fines associated with that. And it's different for everybody. Re Walmart's famous for it. Um, Target, a lot of the big, big box retailers that we go and shop at have those fees, right? And it's, it's really a big, ugly monster monster. And I used to hate the idea of charging fees, but companies aren't really sure part of it's a little bit of a revenue play, but mostly they just want compliance, right? They want the product in the store so that when you and I go to pick something up, it's there and available. It reminds me, I actually brings back memories of trying to deliver and get fees from Walmart uh, for their general merchandise. If you arrive too early, they would give you a fee. Or if you show up at a Sam's Club late, they would give you a fee. Or if you didn't take things at a certain time. Uh, you know, for folks who are trying to wrap their head around it, uh, it, what are some of the biggest things we need to be paying attention to on just trying to avoid uh, nickel and diming ourselves to death and there's no profitability? Yeah, number one, as with any rule in any game, is understand the rules, right? So know what you're dealing with. Every retail is a little bit different. Know what you're dealing with. Know which carriers can handle the freight well and which ones can't. So if you're delivering LTL, there's a certain issue. Um, to your point, you know, delivering early is a problem. Um, we'll have there's times where we we might tender a load to a, a truck driver and they get there, you know, a, a day early because it's a long haul load and they made good time or um, or just had more time in the route than we really needed. So understand the rules and what you're dealing with and then understand how to root cause problem solve, right? Is it really a carrier issue or is it the way that that carrier works with the consignee? Um, and again, everybody's a little bit different. So uh, sometimes it takes some digging and searching and sometimes the, the, the customers who are delivering into these retailers don't even have the routing guides available to them or a good understanding of those routing guides. So uh, there's a lot of digging that needs to happen, whether it's working with carriers locally, calling the locations. I mean, Walmart's this big monster that everybody fears, but you can actually call their location and talk to somebody and they can help you through the problems you're having. So a lot of it just comes down to actually doing some research. And looking at what happens when this occurs, you want to try to mitigate it. Uh, is this something where late, if you get a late fee, does that immediately come out of the carrier's pocket? Am I going to get less on my invoice or does Walmart save up all or other customers, including Walmart correction? Uh, I know of a few others will save them up and then hit me up later, I guess, on the back end. Like what are some things when they do yeah. occur? What should I be worried about in terms of how I'm going to have to deal with these payments? Well, generally speaking, it's a percentage of the invoice amount over like if you're they might charge you two or three percent of the invoice of what they're billing. Right. So it's not coming out of carriers pockets necessarily. Um, and it's unfair to charge a carrier for it because it's, it's a percentage of the sale price of those goods. Right. So if you're selling, you know, three 
uh, $300,000 worth of product in a trailer, it's not fair to charge a carrier 2% of that cost, right? Because their cost is associated with what they're charging you for the load. It has nothing to do with the value of the goods in the, in the trailer. So it's all something that, that those retailers will charge back to their customers. Um, but we deal with that fine line of how do you hold carriers accountable to making sure they're on time for these type of things. And, and to answer your question, it's all billed after the fact. Um, but from a 3PL standpoint, that's our focus is how do we help mitigate this as much as possible? And, and again, it revolves around problem solving, understanding the rules, talking to the retailers where you're having issues, um, Pareto out your issues where you're having them. Is it a carrier problem? Is it just just dealing with that that location and not understanding the rules and how they operate um, and and attacking it that way? So for us, it's it's less about passing those fees on to the providers that are trying to deliver on time. Um, and more about how to mitigate those in the first place, because really Walmart doesn't want to charge anyone. Um, there are Walmart, Target, all of them, they don't really want to charge anyone. They just want their product to show up on time. And unfortunately, sometimes the only way to get people to comply is to hit them where it hurts, and that's in the in the pocketbook. So that's really what they're doing. And the, and the goal is how do, how do you minimize what, what your customer is having to pay, but also set up a system to where everybody's winning, that carriers can deliver on time and and um, get in there when needed. So there, there is a window, even Walmart, they've got a window. It's not just you, you get an hour to deliver. There's a window of, of two days that you can deliver for a lot of products. So it's just a matter of making sure that you understand the rules and, and deliver within those windows. I think uh, you brought up, a, brought up a great point about the windows, because especially in a softer freight environment, tender characteristics, it almost feels like as a carrier, uh, you're, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Do I need to take this freight? I need to get it close. But at the same time, I have maybe 24 hours extra on this before I get hit with the late fee. Is that something where you want the conversations to come from the, the shippers, inbound feeder loads? Or is that something where you have to get with the carriers and say, hey, look, I understand this is how you traditionally handle it. Do you have a storage location nearby? Can you drop a trailer somewhere? Uh, what's some right. of the biggest things you've noticed? Is it normally the supply chain itself or does it normally happen to carrier execution? Um, it, it's, it's a little of both. I mean, there's been times where um, we've had it recently where a driver showed up a day early and when, I, when we looked at the load, it's like, hey, we gave him way too much time on this. Like we should have pushed back when they picked it up because now a carrier's sitting on freight um, and they really, they wanna make money, right? If their wheels aren't turning, they're not making money. So there's a little bit of a balancing act there. Sometimes, um, and again, these, these retailers, there are, if you know what you're doing and you talk to them, like if there's weather weather issues, they're not gonna find uh, their customers when there's weather related issues that nobody could control. But again, you have to understand the rules and know who to reach out to and contact at uh, the retailers to, to help to help with that. So we actually work with our customers and help um, with giving backup documentation to these retailers to say, hey, here's what happened with these. Um, here is the issue at hand, uh, but but to your point, there's a there's a wide array of issues that can happen. It can be a carrier issue. It can be our fault. We tendered it way too early to the carrier, and now he's having to sit on it. So he said, "Forget it. I'm just going to deliver early." Um, so there's there's a lot of things that can happen, but really, it just boils down to understanding the rules, understanding what's driving people's behavior. Um, and, and in different buckets, some people are, are driving behavior because they don't want to get fined. Other people are driving behavior, the carrier, because he wants to make money when his wheels are turning. So it's just about managing all of that uh, and, and driving improvement in the process. Well, it's a tough situation to manage as well because the needs of the retailer and the needs of the carrier often can be uh, contradictory. Uh, final thoughts here as well. Does carrier size, when you're looking at compliance and you're dealing with many different carriers, does size matter? Do larger carriers tend to be more compliant or are smaller ones more uh, agile? Um, you know, that's one of those things that I let data speak for itself. Everybody's a little bit different, right? But I, I, would, I would pull data and look at it. I think everybody can make mistakes. Large carriers can have a 97% a, a on time performance or whatever, whatever that looks like. But also large carriers can lose freight in a network. They might have a drop yard somewhere where they forget about something or it loses in the process. I, so really it's, it's, it's hard to, to just quantify that without actually looking at data and say, here's what the data shows. We use all kinds of carriers, large and small alike. Um, so it, it just varies and some of them are really good at certain retailers. So it's hard to answer that. But again, a lot of this problem is because you and I don't go to the store and order the same thing or the same cadence all the time. Demand fluctuates, right? So really this is just about how, how demand is a bullwhip throughout the supply chain and we try to manage it on the back end. Perfect. And final thoughts here. If folks want to reach out more about ODW Logistics, interested in partnering up or trying to avoid some of these fees, what's the best way to contact you all? Yeah, I can be reached at phil.schmidbauer at odwlogistics.com or through LinkedIn. We're, we're all over LinkedIn as well. So uh, appreciate your time today, Thomas.
Thanks so much, Phil. No more late fees. Blockbuster pioneered it, and it also exists in freight. I have been uh, one of those people as well. I have actually messed up quite a few loads back in my younger days, and unfortunately, it costed money. But enough about me. They're gonna, we're gonna hop to a quick break. Coming up though, after the break, we're gonna have a research corner with Tony Mulvey, and then later on in the show, going to have some more headlines as well as Carrier. Stay tuned. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, Thai TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with Thai's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, Thai saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at thai-software.com. Welcome to Drilling Deep. I'm your host, John Kingston. Drilling Deep is the place where we talk about oil and we talk about diesel and you have to drill to get oil and you have to get oil to make diesel. So that's why we call it Drilling Deep. Drilling Deep drops every Friday on Freightwaves TV and all available podcast platforms. Welcome into this week's edition of the Research Corner. I'm Tony Mulvey, joined remotely by Joe Antishek. Joe, how's it going? Hey, Tony, I'm doing well. How are you doing this morning? Uh, you know, I can't complain. I mean, ultimately, it's a Tuesday after springing forward. It's still hitting, that timeline's still hitting me, but we're here, we made it. So this week, we're gonna talk a lot about what's going on this operating expenses from the carrier side, we'll pull up a chart here real quick that we have put together. So if you look at company filings from the largest truckload carriers, they break down, they give us a lot of information, but it's not always the most useful in its organic form. But what we can do is kind of look at those data points, put them all together, and it gives us a lot of information about what's going on in the, in the market. Well, we'll pull up this chart here. It's Knight Swift's total miles. So they give us, in their company filings, they give you total miles, they give you total miles per tractor for the quarter, they give you total average number of tractors in the quarter, they give you operating expenses and revenue. Basically, you can come out to this total mile uh, figure what you see is this kind of massive decline in the total number of miles driven. At the same time, if you take their operating expenses, divide it by those miles, you can get it to a per mile basis. And what we see is that rapid increase in uh, operating expense per mile that really starts to take up in that, the back half of 2020. Little before we saw the increase in fuel, but what you're seeing is, uh, that operating expense has now risen. 
What's interesting though, and we don't see it necessarily in this chart, but we have another one that we'll talk about eventually, uh, that the revenue number per mile, or revenue per mile number has uh, slowly started to decline over the past couple days, so, or couple quarters. So Joe, I mean, you look at this chart, what do you, what do you see? Or what do you, what do you read from looking at that chart? Yeah, so this is something I feel like we've been talking about a lot in the last couple of weeks. Um, I mean, really, for for uh, this first quarter, it's been a pretty dominant talking point. But this idea that um, expenses have gone up dramatically for carriers, right, uh, to the level where it's like 2023, the name of the game is improving operational efficiency if you're a carrier. Like, you, you've got to find a way to get these expenses down uh, as best you can. Uh, because the revenue is just not going to save you. Like it's, it's, we're, we're not seeing evidence of of a rebound yet, uh, and there's you know certainly potential for for us staying in this kind of valley of a trucking market for a while, and potentially it getting a little bit worse. Um, so right, so I look at this chart, which uh, you know Tony, you did a great job pulling together this this night swift. Um, OpEx chart, and uh, you know it, it sort of confirms what we've been seeing in. Um, surveys recently, which is, you know, right, same thing, carriers saying uh, expenses have gone through the roof. Uh, in 2022, while revenue started to ebb, uh, the story really was these, you know, rise in, in expenses. And, and I think that uh, now in 2023, and we'll probably see it a little bit more as we, you know, get, get new uh, quarterly results in, but right, it's like expenses still high, revenue declining, you know, at, at potentially a faster rate. Yeah, and I think that's gonna be a trend we see, and we'll pull up a chart here, because if you think about operating expenses for a truckload carrier, one of the, arguably the second largest expense is fuel. Now, carriers like a Night Swift or some of those larger carriers have the benefit of buying fuel at, at the wholesale price, right, or the rack price, so we see that. You see the increase that we've had over the past five years, it's really not that much different than what it was in 20, I mean, it's what, 50, 60 cents higher than what it was uh, this time in 20, or in 2018, but compared to 2020, well, 2019, 2020, it's still ridiculously high, but it's yeah. not, that impacts are felt even greater for those carriers that are buying at the retail locations, right? I mean, you're talking, what was it, $3 a gallon back 2018, 2019, now we're talking upwards of $4, so you're talking about a dollar per gallon more than what it was at those times. So, I mean, you, as you mentioned, surveys, we're surveying these carriers, and like, what are they saying about their expectations for uh, operating expenses here in 2023? I mean, is it, do they expect it to, like, are they expecting worse conditions on the operating side in terms of expenses? Do they anticipate them, you know, kind of stalling out or improvement overall? Yeah, so I think last year, a lot of carriers were really caught a bit flat-footed uh, when it came to like, you know, projections for expenses at the beginning of 2022 versus what they actually paid by the end of 2022. Uh, I think it caught a lot of carriers off guard because, you know, they, there there was sort of a market de uh, deterioration that, um, no one could have predicted really, or I mean, I guess you could have, but very few did. Uh, and uh, 2023, I think is a somewhat similar situation. Um, the one like positive lining is that, right, like it doesn't seem like we're gonna see the sort of spike that we saw in 2022 with fuel, right? And fuel, as you mentioned, huge expense for carriers. So um, given that that spike probably will not that kind of spike will not happen in 2023. I think carriers are feeling a little bit better, you know, but it's all it's all relative, right? Like, uh, right, as you mentioned, we have a survey out now kind of gauging confidence in 2023 projections. And on the whole, it seems like carriers are not incredibly confident, but they're not feeling so like, so down in the dumps about it because they were so shell-shocked from 2022. Yeah, and I think one of those trends to pay attention to is hey, operating expenses, even if they get better, if revenues doesn't improve, that revenue per mile number doesn't improve, which it doesn't seem like it is, it doesn't, 
improvement on the operating expense side, it ultimately just keeps, it kind of holds steady that, that operating ratio that's so important to truckload carriers. Uh, but Joe, thank you so much for joining me on this week's edition of the Research Corner. We'll be sure to check in with you again next week. Right now, we'll take a quick break. We'll be back with more Freight Waves Now. Hey everybody, this is Thomas Watson, enterprise trucking carrier expert here at Freight Waves, telling you about my show, Loaded and Rolling. Now, it involves trucking topics for large carriers and even small ones that wish to be large. Anything that impacts trucking, you can get it there. You can catch us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Eastern on tv.freightwaves.com. We do it live. If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, Thai TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with Thai's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, Thai saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at Thai-software.com. Welcome back to Freight Waves Now, everyone. I'm Isaiah Buchanan, and I want to do a PSA for everyone that's going to be driving on US 20 today. There is going to be a speed enforcement blitz on that road with both marked and unmarked vehicles. That's going to be happening in states New York, Iowa, Montana, Wyoming, Nebraska, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, and Pennsylvania. So just make sure if you're driving on US 20 throughout any of those states that you are just watching your speed, making sure you're not going above that speed limit so that you do not get a ticket. Now, there is a big show happening Friday out in Glendale, or should I say Swift City, Arizona. Glendale has announced that they will be going by Swift City this Friday and Saturday in honor of Taylor Swift's the Eras Tour getting started out at the State Farm Arena in Glendale. So they're doing a ceremonial name change for the two days while she kicks off her tour at the State Farm Arena. Uh, I know at those shows she's gonna have Paramore with her, so that's gonna be a really good show and I'm really jealous of everybody who gets to go to that show because I'm sure the Swifties will be flocking in bundles to go see her. I'm sure that there's gonna be a lot of crazy craziness all over social media when it comes to Taylor Swift because there was a whole lot of craziness when it came to trying to actually buy her tickets on whether it was Ticketmaster or StubHub. I mean, people were paying thousands upon thousands of dollars just to go see her. Lastly, there's a big holiday coming up this weekend. That's gonna be St. Patty's Day. And one of the best St. Patty's Day traditions is the Chicago's the city of Chicago turning their river green. Here's a time-lapse video from the Chicago Tribune. It shows boats driving by dropping the dye into the river to give it this bright, bright, bright green neon color. Um, 
you can see the boat right there is dropping, driving, dropping some of that dye into the river. This is one of the best traditions in for St. Patty's Day, in my opinion. It draws a very large crowd to Chicago. About 75,000 people, on average, go to the Chicago St. Patrick's Day Parade, which is one of the biggest in the world outside of Dublin, Ireland. That's all I have for this edition of the Social Roundabout. Right now, I'm going to toss things back over to Bill and Thomas. All right, thank you very much, Isaiah. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's a very interesting tradition. I don't know how big of an Irish population the Chicago has, but that's certainly cool. Well, on that day, everyone's Irish, so it's oh, probably sure, one of the sure. biggest ones. <laughs> Why don't you have another pint? There we go. All right, so uh, coming up next here, we've got our free conversation. And this is a new subject, new segment we've been doing for a number of weeks now. And uh, this is where one interviewee gets to pick the topic for the next interviewee. Ooh. So this has been, you know, it's, it's been an interesting road to take on. And last week we had uh, Harris Ligon uh, on talking a little bit about uh, uh, diversity in the workplace and in freight. And then he turned and asked an interesting question. And this week's guest is Sherry Garner. Brumbaugh of Garner Trucking, and uh, she gets to take on the idea of what about technology and how it has impacted rural areas of the country. So here's what she had to say with that segment. Welcome once again into our freight conversation where each conversation is intertwined with the last and also connected to the next one as well. I'm Bill Priestley and joining us today is Sherry Brumbaugh, the president of Garner Trans Transportation Group. Sherry, thanks so much for joining us. Great to be here. All right. So uh, last week we had a very interesting conversation on gender diversity with uh, Harris Ligon, the CEO of Telegraph, and then he decided to put up this question for the next guest. Why are you so scared of the really tough and hard to solve industries? Why, why, why does technology tend to stay away from barges, construction, manufacturing, farming? Why, why are people afraid to innovate in those areas? What, what's, what's, the, what's the holdup, right? Those, those manufacturing jobs, those heavy industry jobs, those areas of the Midwest and you know the, the Dakotas and the Plains that are, have a, a ton of amazing people doing amazing work that we all rely on to eat and sleep and do a, a lot of different things. Why is innovation slow to get to those areas? That's my question. So it's an interesting, interesting thesis, if you will. Uh, just on face value, let me just open it up to you. What did you think when you first heard the question? Well, you know, it, uh, it is an interesting topic, technology in the trucking industry and innovation. And, and I can speak to that mode of transportation and, and trucking specifically, truckload. I am a truckload carrier. I have about 100 trucks here nestled in Northwest Ohio. So we are the Midwest. We are the heart, Ohio, the heart of uh, the country for sure. But uh, a crossroads um, with a lot of manufacturing and uh, a lot of truck traffic. And we also, where I'm nestled in the part of the country, we have also, you know, ship, shipping, we have air as well, so, and rail. So we have it all here, all, all modes. But, uh, you know, as far as the, you know, innovation in, in the Midwest, I I don't feel I'm being left behind. I feel like I'm, I'm you know, constantly trying to strive for better technology, not only in my own trucks, uh, and we can talk about that a little bit, but uh, you know, what, what kind of technology uh, my customers requiring of us, I, I do certainly appreciate, I, I you know, I, I read a, a bit about uh, his business and, you know, they're providing a solution of the, the communication with the, with their, their customers. And I absolutely do have people completing seven, eight, nine, uh, you know, uh, uh, websites of shipping, you know, up to date, arrive, depart, arrive, depart, you know, what, how much did it weigh and, and all those things. I, I, so there is a efficiency issue for sure. I can, I can speak to that. Uh, it's just that our our industry, our mode of transportation. I feel the the issue could be that we're so broad. I mean, there are so many players. I mean, you look at the rail industry. There are seven major players basically. You you know you've got 
Norfolk Southern, BNSF, United, you know, um, though there's seven uh, compared to the trucking industry where we have 3.5 million trucks operating across our our country. So uh, I can I can see that there's a challenge to collect a lot of data from a lot of different people. sure. Absolutely. Um, one of the things is, and I, I kind of want to get rid of this. Uh, maybe it's it's a presupposition, just kind of at the very beginning. Um, and uh, of course, Harris is is uh, this is based in Chicago, so yeah. it's he's Midwestern based. So it's not as though he's picking on the Midwest. Right. I mean, right. he's picking on himself. Um, but um, I am from the uh i wouldn't say the rural south but i've been a southerner most of my life and i've lived in indianapolis for a year and a half so i can count that as as my one connection to the midwest as as firms of being familiar with the area but um you know as as he brought up that idea of you know the midwest kind of the hard the harder jobs the kind of the industrialized revolution idea of 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 those jobs that have come about it reminded me a little bit of when I was in school and I read a book on reconstruction, mm. uh, Civil War reconstruction, and the author of the book uh, was from New York State. And in three times in the book, he referred to the South as, quote unquote, backwards, mm. which I took offense to slightly. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was all well. And you know, obviously, you were talking about an agrarian society versus a technological one uh, at that particular time. But. With regards to, is there any truth to the idea of of this sort of, you know, the hard backbone of American worker, the Midwesterner, um, in terms of the work that they do? Is there any truth to an idea that that kind of, that there's that, that there's that kind of regionalism mm -hmm. um, that needs to be talked about? Well, I you know I I think we are all hardworking Americans for sure. But there's sure. there's a difference in that the rural where, you know, um, getting you know going to uh, your place of, of work and and working with your hands, you know, obvious, you know, is also there's um, a lot to be said to that. I mean, for Ohio, the number one industry is farming still, mm -hmm. and so that's you know working. Um, with your with your hands and your and your back for for sure, I I look at truckers and farmers. We're kind of like peas and carrots. We we kind of go um, if it's raining, we're complaining that it's raining. If it's not raining, we're complaining that it's not raining. And it's so and, and you know freight kind of works that way too. I don't have enough freight or I have too much freight. You know it's this ebb and flow. But uh, you know you, uh, you know as far as you know the work ethic I. Um, you know, we we all work hard, and it, it's just in different ways. Um, and we just have to yeah. uh, appreciate each other for how we, uh, you know, how we get our work done. Absolutely, you make great points there as well. All right, Sherry Garner Brumbaugh, it is time for you to direct the conversation somewhere else. Let's say, for instance, that you're uh, in an arena. You have the ear of everyone in the freight industry. You're at the podium. Where would you like to see the conversation go from here? Well, I, I spoke to it a bit. I uh, I would say let's embrace a younger driver. Let's embrace that younger driver. Let's embrace the younger generation. Let's get out in our schools. Uh, open up your doors. Let people come and see what you do in in your trucking operation or whatever operation you have, rail, air, or sea, you know, you can uh, bring young people to the industry. There are so many opportunities. And as I've um, had the opportunity to work with our local university here and our young people really like to travel and they just want a, a, a good career. It's like pick, pick the transportation industry and take a pinpoint and put it anywhere on the globe anywhere where do you want to go and you will find uh you know logistics you will find trucking you will find air sea uh rail and you will have a good career in the industry is there a question that you'd like to tag along with that as well yes i think it it uh, also takes on to my conversation about bringing younger people to the industry and i'd have to ask the question why can't an 18 year old drive a truck if they're properly trained, they could. 
That's a good question and one that I'm certain our next uh, next guest is going to have a fun time trying to answer. Sherry, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Go on to youtube.com slash freight waves and catch the entire conversation. It's about 28 minutes between myself and Sherry Garner Brumbaugh as uh, she outlines kind of how t- uh, technology has impacted those areas in the rural parts of the country and uh, how she would actually change things uh, if she had the money and the power to do it. We'll take a short break, come back with ne- more stuff here on Freight Waves Now. If you're a freight broker looking for ways to make your team more efficient, TIE-TMS can speed up your spot quoting process by organizing all of your pricing intelligence tools and lane history on a single page. Help you find load coverage faster with the ability to email blast your carrier network, post directly to load boards, or leverage capacity management tools from a single page. And with TIE's native texting feature and direct integrations to tracking applications, TIE saves your team hours a day on track and trace. Find out more at tie-software.com. Join FreightWaves live webinar series, The State of Freight. Each month, Craig Fuller, FreightWaves founder and CEO, and Zach Strickland, head of market intelligence, will cover the current state of the freight market, share industry expertise, and offer critical insights that were previously made available only to subscribers of FreightWaves supply chain analytics and high-frequency data platform, Sonar. Watch FreightWaves State of Freight live monthly webinar series. Register at FreightWaves.com slash events to reserve your place now. Yeah. Welcome back, folks. I'm Thomas. It's time for the final look of the headlines. Proposition 22, which kept California's independent contractor law AB5 from applying to app-based drivers like those from Uber and DoorDash, has been kept alive by a state appellate court ruling and a decision that lays the groundwork for an appeal because the three-judge panel did not fully agree on the issues. The Court of Appeal for the first appellate district reversed the core of an earlier decision that Prop 22 was unconstitutional and exempting app based workers from AB5. That lower court decision from August 2021 was stayed, and app-based workers, mostly drivers, continued to work without being impacted by the more restrictive independent contractor definitions of AB5. In more news, Navistar Inc. is really living for a third time a recall of medium and heavy duty trucks experiencing engine revving that can overwhelm the parking brake and lead to unintended movement. The Trotton Group subsidiary is recalling nearly 30,000 international HV and MV trucks from the 2022 to 24 model years and IC bus TC commercial buses from the 2022 to 23 model years sold in the U.S and Canada. All of the recalled vehicles could experience the issue. Navistar reported no crashes or injuries. The acquisition of a majority stake in pilot travel centers by Berkshire Hathaway has led to a significant increase in the company's debt rating by S&P Global Ratings. Pilot's triple double B plus corporate rating was affirmed in mid-2021, though one debt issue was reduced at that time to double B plus level. Double B plus is not considered investment grade debt. But with Berkshire Berkshire Hathaway now owning 80% of the company and the Haslam family owning the rest, S&P rating took Pilot's rating up three notches to triple B plus in one shot. 
taking it back into investment grade categories. Now, you can find these stories and much more on FreightWaves.com and on our new app. If you're watching on YouTube, whether live or on demand, don't forget that, to hit that like and subscribe button to stay updated. For the full FreightWaves TV experience, log on over to TV.FreightWaves.com. That's it for the news. We're going to toss it over for our final look at the carrier update with Tony and Donnie. Welcome into the final carrier update. Donnie, going to get into our lanes of the day. This is one I talked about last Friday. It's one that keeps kind of popping up because Memphis keeps popping up. And it's it's a pretty important lane for the south, the southeast, right? I mean, it's two really freight hubs touching the connection of two freight hubs. in the rate, not too bad. No, it's a, it's a shorter run, but still, it's 400 miles. It'd be wonderful if he, if, if he, if he had a rate like this for a 500, 550 mile run. But, you know, it is 400, of course, getting in Atlanta could burn up a lot of time to where maybe you can't go the 500 miles. But once yep. you get out of Atlanta, uh, this will be a, a fairly easy run. But Memphis to Atlanta, Georgia, 393 miles, and it's still showing about $2.98 a mile. And we were kind of looking at Memphis showing, you know, it's popped up in a, on a couple of blues here and there. So one of the lanes that I want to, or a market that I want to bring up. So keep an eye on the Memphis market here. It's hard to find these lanes that are $3 plus a mile. Yeah. And here, you know, we used to find them all the time at three, 350. Now we're struggling to find them over 250. Yep. So uh, one of the markets to keep an eye on because the head haul index uh, is the Memphis market and you can find some decent lanes. Now, if you're a carrier out of the Atlanta market, which you probably are, it might be a good idea to accept more freight on that Atlanta to Memphis lane. And then this would be your backhaul at almost $3 a mile. That's not too much that you can really complain about. Yep, absolutely. All right, next lane here. Uh, turn this around, head Atlanta back to Memphis. A little bit different, but when you go from a, from a, if when you're headed into the hot market, it's $2.38 because normally those prices push down. And this is why I tell you, this would be the lane that I would choose to run as your contract lane. Like I say, it's gonna be mainly a, a, a carrier that's based out of the Atlanta area probably, has lanes from Atlanta to Birmingham, Atlanta to Chattanooga, Atlanta to Memphis, Atlanta to Charlotte and uh, landed in Jacksonville or Savannah. And th this would be the market I'd try to accept all these that I can. And then of course, get those rates coming back out of Memphis. Yeah. And the good news along this lane, even if you had to run it at spot or in the spot market, it's improved, right? I mean, we were talking, what, a discount of 40 cents to the NTI back in November. Yeah. Now we're at a premium to the NTI. We're at 238 versus the 231. So, I mean, it's improved. It's not obviously three dollars a mile, but it's also not a dollar ninety a mile. Like it was kind of on that trend towards. Sure, and I say, but uh, very true. But this is why I throw it in the market dashboard. See those trends and changes. Yep. And like I say, in, in Atlanta can pay better as well, but you're going to have to go to those markets like Charlotte where nobody wants to go. Yep. And then you'll get a better lane out of that out of that Atlanta market. Yep. <clears throat> All right, next lane here. Uh, Nashville, Tennessee, it also popped up here. So I went in and threw in Nashville to uh, Kansas City, uh, a good 555 mile run, but it's still trending down uh, on this lane. It's 254, but it's above 250. But keep an eye because we saw some, some upward trends on this Nashville market. We saw rejection rates starting uh, to, to trend upward. And if, if carriers start to push back and start pushing up, you can see lanes out of this Nashville market start to react and rates actually start to go up. Yep, absolutely. Move. Flip it around. Yeah, uh, flip it around here. Uh, Kansas City headed back, and it's also trained down at 242. So you got about a, a 245, 248 average rate per mile. Yeah, and that decline's really stalled out. Uh, so, I mean, it's probably found, I don't want to say it's found the floor, but it, it's found a spot where carriers in this lane are, are almost comfortable. They're not, or they're trying to push back. They don't want it to go any lower than this. This Correct. Level. At least they've, so. they've stopped the downward trend. Yep. But you're still looking at an 1,100 mile round trip run at around 250 a mile, so. and you're not in any real big areas where fuel prices are exploding. Yep. You're kind of on that edge where it starts to turn that lighter blue. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Donnie, thank you so much for the updates this morning. We'll be sure to check in with you again on Thursday. Right now, we'll hand it back over to Bill and Thomas.
Thank you, gentlemen. We're about to finish up our show, but like all goodbyes, I'm not quite going away just yet. <laughs> Going to have a lot more stuff coming up. Put that coffee down coming up at noon. Check call at 12.30 with Mary O'Connell, who you heard from earlier, as well as myself, loaded and rolling. Told you, you couldn't get rid of me just no, yet today. No, no, we've tried. I'll even be back tomorrow. <laughs> at your doorstep, as well as great quarter gals to round it out. Tomorrow, though, I'm going to be here. I hope you are, too. Supply Chain Meets Fintech going to be tomorrow the 15th. Sign up now, as well as register to win a Yeti cooler. Live.freightwaves.com. Make sure you get there because it's going to be a whole lot of fun all day long, especially if you are anywhere in the financial markets that, uh, as, as it relates to the supply chain. Exactly. But that's going to be a wrap for this show. Catch us again at tomorrow, 9 a.m. Don't miss it. Stay classy. Stay rolling. That's all, folks. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com.
Hello, everyone, and thanks so much for joining us for this technology update. I'm Anthony Smith, Chief Economist here at FreightWaves, and today I'm joined by John Baccaro, President at Betaway Supply Chain Services and founder of Pallet Trader. John, thanks so much for joining us today. Anthony, thanks for having me on again. So, John, let's dive right into it. Tell us about Pallet Trader, what it is, how it works, how was it reimagined, the process by which pallets were bought and sold in the past? Simply said, Pallet Trader is the world's first online marketplace for buying and selling pallets. To break that down, what does it mean and why is it important? Uh, if we think about freight and how freight has evolved in the last 25, 30 years uh, between low boards, indexes, uh, online bids, uh, transportation management systems, none of that has occurred in pallets. And yet the volume and the importance of pallets is equal to transportation. Uh, so we've been in both sectors, and I think that's what my inspiration was. You know, I spend half of my day in the world of transportation, high tech, and the other side is pallets, and it's kind of low tech. And it dawned on me a few years ago that this was missing and that it, it was warranted by the size of the pallet industry. It's over a $15 billion industry. So the light bulb went off, and I said, this is overlooked. Uh, and if we don't do this, somebody else will. And it may be a, a technology play. It may be some, no disrespect, but some young kid in a college dorm room. And, you know, that's going to bring disruption, but the wrong disruption to this industry. So we built Pallet Trader, you know, as a pallet provider in the industry for the industry is what we did. How it works is it's much like an Amazon, an eBay, a LinkedIn, an Etsy. I kind of drew on my experience and inspiration from all of those online sites to pick the best of breed. So basically, Basically, buyers and sellers could go on, sellers could go on like on Amazon and they have an instant online marketplace to, to post their goods. Uh, they could post it for a price, it doesn't have to be a bid. I also like the eBay type functionality where you could have a buy it now or you could have a bid, so that's on there as well. You know, LinkedIn inspired me with the private uh, messaging and the private groups. I felt, you know, if I'm going to create this tool, it should not only be a, a buyer's and seller's marketplace. I should wrap a, a TMS type system in there for pallets. Give people another reason other than just buying and selling to be there. Give them the tools. That's what Rose TMS is, right? It was the ability to go in, input your data, track your loads, get bill of ladings, get paid right away. So that's kind of what we're bringing to it uh, in a nutshell in Pallet Trader. So, John, it sounds like you're really bringing this industry forward by quite a few decades. Is that right? I mean, it looks like this industry and this segment was really kind of behind and really lacking. It sounds like this is really bringing a whole new light to the buying and sourcing process. That's exactly. You know, for a lot of ways, again, the pallet industry, in my mind, is somewhere caught in the late 80s, early 90s, as far as what they do. Don't get me wrong, the owners of the businesses are all tech savvy. They have emails and all. But there's really been no focus on it as far as systems and processes, but like the way the transportation did. And basically, that was it. So, uh, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're just reapplying it in a different model. And John, when we're talking about pallets, can you talk about the commodity aspect to them and, and to the industry? I mean, we were talking about a commodity in the sense of being able to interchange a good for that same good. Yeah, you know what? Pallets, that's what kind of made it so conducive to being an online marketplace. You know, pallets is a very big industry, but there's only a handful of different pallet sizes and types. There's not thousands of SKUs. Maybe there's 10 or 15 of them. And they're readily traded. A lot of them are common, and they're bought and sold. Uh, they're sold in different levels, on different grades, whether they're new, used, or broken. And especially during the pandemic, when, you know, it's just, we live in a supply and demand economy. I believe in that, and I believe the free market prevail all over. So what did we see in the pandemic? All of a sudden, people who never paid attention to pallets, they had pallet issues. And they went and they squirried to get pallets. And, and what did that do? It elevated the price, like any typical marketplace. Now we're seeing it come down. So, you know, they act like a commodity, similar like freight, but there's been no really good, fair uh, trading place for this to take place. So that's what pallet traders bring to the market. So, John, you mentioned something there that definitely piqued my interest and got me excited, and that's just letting the free market prevail. And, of course, as an economist, I need to know what are the economics behind this? You know, how do you really look at making money at this and really being able to recoup your investment? Really great question. First, let me uh, uh, let me answer to recoup the investment. Though we really looked at Pallet Trader as as a long play. Uh, clearly, as economics, we wanted to make sure that we got an investment back. But we look at it as venture. We look at it as putting back 
uh, and, and helping the power industry that helped us for the past 35 years put food on our table, doing it, you know, giving it back. Uh, so there's definitely an economic play in the end, but we play long. So I'm really not looking when do I get my investment back. I want to see it work. I want to create something really special. I want it to be a great experience. But to answer your question, when we were building this, you know, cost was very much in my mind. How do I go to market with this? Uh, we definitely didn't want to be a broker working on margin. Uh, what we wanted to do was we chose the marketplace, the Amazon, eBay type, you know, where it would be a fee. Now, when I thought about a fee, I knew that it needed to be very low in order for people to use it. So the platform is a subscription-based service right now. We've waived subscription. It's free until I build critical mass. So it's going to stay free for at least a year in my mind. And it's 1.5% for the buyer, 1.5% for the seller. Plus, if they choose to use a credit card fee, it's the credit card fee. If they choose to use ACH, then it's only the 1.5% in the transaction. Uh, and that's it, Anthony. So at 1.5%, there's no reason for someone to say, why would I use this or it's, or it's more money? You know, a pallet, let's take uh, $10 as a, as, as a price for a pallet. I mean, it's 15 cents then to use the site, you know, per, per pallet. So there's the economics on it. John, this is definitely an exciting time for Pallet Trader. And when you're looking at how far you've come and what you're doing right now, what's been the biggest challenge as you've brought this platform to the market? You know, the challenge was more exciting. It was uh, from a simple idea of what we wanted to put together as a marketplace. It definitely grew in features and in scope as we went along. And it grew for the right reasons. We wanted to make sure that there was a great value proposition for users other than just the marketplace. We wanted to give them features and tools, the same as they have in transportation management systems. So that put us out a little bit longer, but I think we built a really great system for it. It's gonna provide excellent value for anyone that uses it. Uh, I think the second challenge will be a, a forever challenge, and that's building critical mass and building density. Uh, like any marketplace, you need buyers and sellers, and we often spoke about the chicken and the egg. What do we do first? Do we solicit buyers or do we solicit sellers? You know, you have to have sellers, so when a buyer goes on, it's there. So right now, we have several hundred sellers on there. Uh, we've got a large media campaign with digital billboards going up across the country. We're going to work on the buyers, and then we're also going to start building the sellers. So it's, you know, it's an evolving journey of building density, as you know, and that's the way any critical business works, and that's the mission we're on now. John, I'm excited to see the future of Pallet Trader and, and continue to watch this, this company expand and all the growth that you're going to have. Um, if people want to reach out to you, find out a little bit more about Pallet Trader, how can they do that? PalletTrader.com, please. I'd love to hear from anybody that's interested in, in us. I'd love to hear from other companies or industries that want to partner with us some way. Just reach out. Our motto is we're open for business. Awesome, John. Thanks so much for your time today. And thank you all so much for tuning in. And we'll see you on the next update. Mm -hmm. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. Do you want to watch the weirdest show in Freight? that age.
Welcome back to another edition of Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet. FreightWaves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app.
to an event like F3, we know what they want is a chance to show off their products, their swag, and make new partnerships that will last until our next Freight Waves event. But the problem is, there are so many industry events, it can be so hard to find the right one to invest your time and energy in. We at Freight Waves take your investment seriously. Which is why we've brought together thousands of industry professionals in one city over three days to showcase all you have to offer. Because your successful connections at an event like F3 move all of us forward. Don't believe us? Join, Join us in June. Freight Waves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app. Do you want to watch the weirdest show in freight? Catch your Nooner with Dooner right here on Freight Waves TV live every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at noon Eastern time or on video on demand and podcast players whenever you got to scratch that itch. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com.
Welcome back to another edition of Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, okay. Is pizza well, an open face I, sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet.
2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. FreightWaves is the number one source for transportation and logistics news. FreightWaves.com provides you with in-depth news coverage, data, and insights from the leading industry journalists and market experts. On FreightWaves.com, you can also watch the only streaming TV network dedicated to freight. FreightWaves TV provides you with coverage you won't find anywhere else. However you like your news delivered, check us out online or on the FreightWaves app. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call, Check Call, Check Call, Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know. <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're Welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet. The 2023 Freight Tech 25 list is filled with meaningful innovators from across the industry who are helping shape what the future of supply chain will look like. Check out the full list of these companies and all the latest Freight Tech news at FreightWaves.com. Do you want to watch the weirdest show in Freight? that age. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call, Check Call, Check Call, Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? <laughs> oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry now. Folks, welcome back to another episode of The Drop Zone. As usual, I'm your host, Jack Dalio, and I've got another awesome guest. Uh, but before we talk about drone delivery, uh, let's talk about what's going on on the ground. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, so as some of you may know, my reporting for Freight Waves is, you know, it focuses on everything last mile delivery. Uh, obviously, that includes drones or 
I wouldn't be talking to you right now, but last month I wrote about uh, 10 last mile delivery companies that are changing the way we deliver. And they're doing some pretty exciting stuff. Um, you know, we now have companies that can make a fleet of delivery vans appear pretty much out of thin air. We've got companies that tell retailers exactly where and how they should store their inventory. Uh, companies whose sole purpose is to shave uh, just a few seconds off of delivery route based on mountains and mountains of data. Uh, we even have a few companies that do all of those things in one platform. Um, now, some of these firms have been around for a while, uh, but during the pandemic, we saw them really take off. Uh, retailers have started to see the importance of the post-sale experience. Uh, and today, you're really seeing the results of that, uh, that adoption. You know, you've got massive retailers like Amazon and Walmart. Uh, you've got small businesses that are a fraction of the size, but pretty much no matter, and you know, wherever you shop online, uh, you're probably going to have the option for next day delivery, scheduled delivery, uh, in-store curbside pickup. Um, you know, I could talk about the that last mile space forever, but take everything that I just said, all of those fleet management solutions, those data-driven optimization tools, uh, those inventory management platforms, and imagine them in the context of drones. Imagine a world where any retailer could add drones to their fleet on demand or build their own fleet and have all the responsibilities that come with it from flight path optimization to order management to uh, live shipment tracking uh, and have all of those managed by another company. Uh, hopefully I have your attention because you don't have to imagine this mythical platform. It already exists. Uh, it's called AnyMile, and it was launched last month by Mitsubishi Electric. That's the arm of Mitsubishi that manufactures electronics and uh, electrical equipment. Uh, this is still a very new service, but the goal of its founders is pretty much exactly what I described, to create one platform where brands can build, manage, monitor, and optimize a fleet of delivery drones uh, all in one place. You don't need to hear it from me, though, because I was able to convince Zafair from the NMIL team to come on the show uh, and break down this brand new platform for you. All right, I'm going to let this month's guest take the floor. Uh, with me, I have Zafair Salonlu, uh, General Manager at Mitsubishi Electric Innovation Center, which is a part of Mitsubishi Electric uh, that invests in early stage and startup companies in areas like mobility, energy, and logistics. Uh, so he's part of a new platform called AnyMile that could change the way drone delivery is done, and we're going to talk about how in just a moment. Uh, so without further ado, Zafair, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure uh, to, to be here with you, Jack. Yeah, uh, it's, it's great to have you on. And we're, we're here to talk about AnyMile, which was launched uh, just a couple months ago. Uh, it's billed as a, a drone-based logistics platform. Uh, but can you explain to people watching and listening uh, exactly what that means? Uh, the way I understand it, the goal is to uh, make drone delivery more accessible option for businesses. But you know, how would you describe it and what can people do with it? When you ask someone what a drone is, they will probably describe a small drone from DJI or uh, many other manufacturers they, that can fly a very short distance, form factor is small, and there, there's a multitude of manufacturers um, of these type of drones. And if you are flying a small drone a short distance, that operation is very simple. You just need a software and uh, probably apply to FAA for uh, a recreational flight permission, and then you are good to go. A couple of years ago, I attended an event, and it was the first time I met a manufacturer of a drone that can fly several hundred miles and heavy lift several hundred pounds. And when I, it intrigued me, and I did more research and then I discovered more manufacturers emerging with similar capabilities. And when drones are bigger, then resource need becomes important. So you cannot land these drones any place. And airspace management becomes critical. And, and larger drones will require parking, fueling, charging, repair, and, and maintenance kind of support services. So all of a sudden, the number of moving pieces increases uh, uh, almost exponentially. And 
there there are many players on the infrastructure piece companies are manufacturing terminals for bigger drones drones can land take off and and get their needs served so we talked about the manufacturers of drones and a, a number of players and there are companies uh, developing air traffic management software for drone operations as well but all these activities at different layers the physical layer which is the drones the infrastructure layer for the drone resources and the air traffic they're kind of disconnected right now so and and you need a glue layer that can bring all these pieces together and orchestrates this entire operation and you will need to manage uh, shippers and receivers activities in logistics world. Yeah, you need a software to manage your drone resources and operational drones. Which drone should take which job? Is it suitable to do it? Based on its calendar and availability, can it be assigned? And so managing those drone resources and your fleets. And you also need the software to manage the resources on the infrastructure side. When a drone fleet operator needs to serve a particular drone for its parking need, where is the parking spot that you can utilize? Is it a mile away or 10 miles away? Is it available when you need it? Like, who is going to make sure you can access the resources and you can make the resources available? Such a software touching all these different layers doesn't exist today. That's why we decided to build a platform called Animile to, to, to fill this missing piece. So it will make, Animile will make it easy and accessible for individuals like you and I and corporates to, to create a fleet operation business or, or create a, a, an infrastructure service business. Uh, and at the end, it will look like a combination of Expedia, serving shippers and receivers, Uber, serving fleet operators, and kind of Airbnb, managing select capacity of individuals and entities to, to provide to this operation. Yeah, and so you mentioned that the software like this doesn't exist. You know, I'd argue that it does, but not in drones. It's in ground transportation, right? I mean, you're you're kind of doing for drones what uh, an end-to-end -end logistics management platform is doing for ground transportation. You know, unifying your TMS, your WMS, your YMS, all your MSs. Uh, you're, you're doing that for for drone delivery, right? You're you know unifying all of these systems, uh, air traffic management. Uh, dispatching, routing, order management. Um, yeah, can you, yeah. Can you run through, you know, some more of the features that that people can do with this platform? Um, you know, something that you didn't mention that I, I want to highlight is the the marketplace side of any mile. Um, can you talk a bit a bit more about about that and what people can do with that? How about we walk through a journey of a typical user uh, from different perspectives? Okay, Let, let's say you have a cargo that you want to ship to Mel. Um, 50 miles away and uh, you you will you will you will log into any mile shipment management application you will enter your destination origin and destination addresses and package specifications in terms of its dimensions and weight whether it's hazardous content or not and then animal will populate options for you similar to how Expedia is displaying flight options and based on the price or earliness, you will choose one option and then confirm. At that point, you are done. So you can, you can trace the status of your shipment and, um, and you can, you can uh, see list of your uh, placed orders. So uh, with a bunch of features. And as soon as you confirm your shipment option, Animal creates a mission for a drone operator that's going to serve that cargo transport job. The, the mission includes a pilot. Right? You need to assign a pilot to a drone. You need to first assign a drone. And 
if the customer requested insurance, you need to also arrange insurance for it. You, you need to, to assign these resources to a mission. And if a mission is a direct kind of flight from an origin terminal to a destination terminal, that's an easy path. But sometimes the distance may be so long that the drone may need parking or fueling in between. So the fleet manager needs to request such additional services for the mission. So you can add a parking service to a mission or a fueling service to a mission. And as soon as you, that, you do that, then the service provider will receive such a request. And, uh, and then when your drone stops over at a point at a service terminal, then it will get served and then will continue to complete its mission. So it's more about, it's kind of a, an ERP system. You manage your resources, you plan your resources to successfully perform a mission and successfully uh, perform a service for a drone. And these missions that you're talking about, um, you know, just to clarify, um, th these aren't, you know, short range, uh, one or two mile deliveries. These are, you know, longer range that could be multi-stop trips, right? A mission can be a one mile uh, a mission or a 300 mile mission. It depends on what the shipper wants and what uh, a drone is capable of. So any mile is, is offering uh, a really wide range of, of delivery options here. Um, and, and you right. also... And then we, we don't offer the drones ourselves. So those are manufacturer and operator partners. They, they join the platform with their fleet capabilities and we help them manage their operation. Right. And that's that's also, uh, you know, partially where that that marketplace offering comes in. Right. You know, you're you're, as I understand, uh, allowing drone manufacturers to uh, to sell online to businesses that might want to build their own drone fleet. Is that is that right? Correct. That, that's uh, another piece on the platform. Yes. We built an application for drone manufacturers and also manufacturers on the infrastructure side to promote their products. So you can join the app, uh, enter multimedia contents of your products, descriptions, specs, and push those contents to a public marketplace for consumption by the general audience and, we, and with financing leasing options. So we want to promote products of manufacturers in this industry and accelerate innovation. Yeah, so you're 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 really uh, you know giving businesses a lot of options here to to be able to create their own fleet or to to have their their own uh, you know I guess third party fleet that uh, that they don't even need to to manage. Um, you know, I want to talk about the implications of all of this because uh, you know as we mentioned before, logistics management platforms are uh, pretty ubiquitous at this point for trucks and last mile delivery vans, but. You know, what opportunities does this model open up for drone delivery? You know, could we reach a point where uh, businesses can add drone delivery capacity the same way they add capacity for their other fleets and have those operations be managed entirely by a third party like any mile? Um, that's very possible. And that's our vision. Uh, I will mention uh, several specific markets as potential early adopters, Jack. And let, let's talk about the traditional less than truck load in the US. Uh, the entire LTL industry is about $150 billion in the US. And considering the, the distance and payload lifting capability of these mid-range drones, uh, zero to 500 pound payload of LTR can be served by mid-range drones. And that payload category corresponds to about 7 to 10% of today's entire LTL uh, logistics market size. And interestingly, in the current LTL industry, in that small 
payload category for LTL, zero to 500 pound is the smallest payload for customers. Customers experience the worst on-time delivery and on-time pickup. So the weakness of the current LTL seems to be the strength of mid-range drones. So they can come into the picture and improve the, the on-time pickup, on-time delivery performance of the current LTL practice. Right, they can they can essentially uh, pick up some of that slack or, or some of that inefficiency that you're, you're seeing in that area uh, and, and bring it into the air. Um, you know, and, and one consequence of that will be a, cont a contribution to, to reducing traffic congestion. You will be eliminating some truck trips from roads. Yeah, that, that was something I wanted to bring up. You know, I, I would imagine that uh, you know, by, by doing so, the sustainability benefits and the environmental impact would be pretty massive, right? Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. No, it, and, go ahead. Sorry. And another uh, potential early adopter market is hospital networks. We had several conversations with uh, major hospital networks in the U.S. And they described their current business practice as just-in-case operation. If you, if you are running a hospital network from multiple locations, in the just-in-case operation, you buy inventory such as blood, soft goods, medicines, vaccines in excess and keep that excess uh, inventory at every location so that when somebody needs blood, you can serve that need immediately. But if you don't need that blood, it's not demanded, it expires after a year and you, you dispose it. Just one hospital network, the cost of expired goods in the just-in-case operation to them was described as $1 billion. So if we can move transition from just in case to just in time, in which you don't buy inventory in excess, but you, you buy it at a minimum level at, and keep it at several locations, but using these mid-range drones that can respond to a need very quickly and transport these items very fast from one location to another, uh, that will give you tremendous uh, operational cost reduction opportunities. So these drones will help organizations switch easily from just in case to just in time. Yeah, I think it's uh, that this well suited use case for drones, and we're we're already starting to see uh, several companies that have really dug into that medical drone delivery space. Uh, Zipline is is one that comes to mind. Uh, they had the news come out a couple months ago that they're working with the the government of Rwanda. So this is a government backed project to uh, establish a nationwide medical drone delivery network. So we're we're already seeing that concept really start to take off. No pun intended, um, and and I think that is a good segue to uh, to a little news update that I wanted to discuss. Uh, we're going to take you to the other side of the world for this one. Um, so South Korea in February launched its own government-backed project. Uh, so they're looking to enable drone and robot delivery in major cities by 2026. And they're doing that by incentivizing private companies to build uh, these high-tech micro-fulfillment centers um, that are fully automated and they can do things like manage inventory, predict demand. Uh, it, it's really interesting stuff. Um, we saw we saw Rwanda do that just a few months ago as well. Um, my question for you is, you know, will a countrywide drone network like this succeed? Uh, and I guess two questions: and will it ever succeed in the United States? In my view, Jack, a drone-based operation will be more local and regional, serving the needs of local businesses, and. We will not see a fleet operator nationwide. So, and that creates a challenge, an inherent challenge in which a lot of customization, personalization is required in, in every single setup. There is no cookie cutter approach here. 
So that makes the scaling harder indeed. So, so therefore, a platform like this, at least reducing certain pain points, will, will accelerate innovation, adoption, and, and scaling. But we expect that on the animal platform, there will be a large number of operators, but each operator will be serving a particular city or a county. Right. So you don't think it'll shake out like, you know, uh, like, like what we see with, with nationwide carriers, you know, UPS, FedEx, uh, they, they've got the entire country covered. Uh, you think it'll be more like uh, regional carriers, perhaps, uh, you know, each covering a certain market. Uh, maybe one covers the, the Bay Area, one covers the, the tri-state area, um, and they kind of create this, this patchwork. That, that's, that's how we f foresee the picture, yes. More local operators, a large number of operators, but uh, uh, not any big na nationwide operator. That's not going to be the case. Yeah, no, a, a countrywide network like that, it's, uh, it's a pretty Jetsonian vision, um, and I, it may stay that way. Uh, but I appreciate your take on that. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you again for, for coming on the show and giving us the lowdown on any mile. Um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a really interesting platform to keep an eye on and a model that we could see really become ubiquitous in drone delivery, uh, just as it did within logistics and transportation. You know, it makes a lot of sense. You've got all of these disparate pieces working together. Uh, you need some way to to unify them all, and that's what Any Mile is all about. So appreciate you coming on the show and, and informing us all about what you're doing. It was a pleasure, Jack. Yes. Yeah, and to the folks watching or listening, until next time, thanks for dropping in. Welcome back to another edition of Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Check Call. Let's go. Nobody works for free, so why should we be expecting our drivers to? Okay, let's just get it together now. What are some of those proactive steps that you can start taking um, now for myself? I would like the earth to still be here for a little bit longer, but, right. you know, <laughs> is a hot dog a sandwich? Oh, okay. Is pizza an open face sandwich? It's bread. I have been ready for this question. <laughs> I've seen the show. We're all in this together. Thanks for making me hungry. Now I want a hot dog. <laughs> You're Welcome. Catch episodes of Check Call Tuesdays at 12.30 on FreightWaves TV. Keep up with all things Check Call on FreightWaves.com slash Check Call. See you on the internet.